morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, VIP workshop. Uh, well, first of all, I have to explain that <clears throat> this VIP workshop is done together with the Task 15 of the International Energy Agency, and it's because we have already uh, done the, on, on Monday and on Tuesday um, the meetings here that normally are done in different places in the world, and we have hosted this, uh, this event uh, here the last two days. And that's why you can see here many international people, all of them experts in VIPB. And well, taking advantage of the situation, we have also uh, uh, we have also planned this this VIPB workshop in order to uh, explain well or solve uh, the, the doubts that you may have regarding this this topic. Um, well, um, it was planned to do it uh, just uh, face to face meeting. So everybody here, but finally there were many people asking for uh, to do it online for a online link. So that's why finally we have decided to uh, to do it also online. So there are some people also connected online and also people who is part of this uh, EIA of this International Energy Agency group um, that is uh, in other parts of the world and also connected online. And um, well, uh, let's move to the first speaker. Uh, in many cases, the people used to ask us uh, in Technalia, uh, how many people you are, where are you exactly located, um, what are, uh, how you are divided in divisions and so on. And well, in order to, to solve all these questions, uh, here we have one of our uh, directors of the uh, energy and, and environmental division, sorry. And, uh, well, please. Jose Luis Alejandre, the floor is yours. I will try to, to explain please. some of uh, the questions about Tecnaria. Probably maybe we maybe. can use the micro, otherwise maybe the... Can you hear me? Back. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Him? Okay, so okay. we have the mic. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning for those connected via Teams. Let's see. Um, sorry. So it's a pleasure to be here with you today in this uh, workshop of this uh, project that is very important for us. We will understand that the world's why. So, First of all, let me introduce myself. I am Jose Luis Alejandre. I am the director of the business unit of uh, Energy, Climate and Urban Transition. We are around 450 people working on seven different areas, uh, smart grids, meteorology and climate, smart cities and resilience, renewable energies, smart buildings and infrastructures, hydrogen and energy materials, and construction materials and products. And this project for us, as you can imagine, is important for us because uh, uh, it groups or joins or meets uh, two different people, two different kind of people inside of organization, people coming from renewable energies and also from smart buildings and infrastructures. I hope you have enjoyed these uh, three days in the Basque Country. I hope, I hope so. Uh, I hope also that uh, you have a taste uh, San Sebastian gastronomy also. <coughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Went for dinner yesterday. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Great. So for me it's a pleasure and let me introduce Tecnalia in some, in a few highlights. We are the largest applied research and technological development center in Spain. We are a technological institute, a private technological institute, with of course a general and social purpose. We are a non-profit organization, but a private non-profit organization. Sorry. We are located mainly in the past country. About 90% uh, of our people is, we are located in the past country, but we have also offices in other places in Spain, mainly in Madrid, and in other places around Europe and in South America. As uh, many other technological institutes in, in Europe, we work in this space between the research of the basic, basic research of the universities and the applied uh, development or engineering of the companies. We work as a bridge 
between the basic research and the applied development or engineering of the companies. Our mission is to transform technological research into prosperity. We are around 1,500 people, 1,500 people, as I have said before, mainly located in the Basque country. There are about 300 uh, doctors from uh, 80, uh, sorry, 28 different nationalities. And we, we are an organization, as a private organization, very committed to the results. Always thinking about our clients. Sorry? Always thinking about our clients. The client is in the middle of all, of all our strategy and uh, facilitating their activity with a close and useful service. This service also is another, is another important word for us because uh, we are not a goal by ourselves. I mean that uh, a technological institute, we are a tool for competitiveness. So we must have this mind always in our, in our minds, uh, service and trying to help the others and to generate impact. Our goal is to generate <coughs> impact. I must insist, we are not a goal, we are a tool, tool for others, mainly for industry and companies, and also for the global society. So we offer technological solutions that generate high impact opportunities, and we are committed to applying results. We have ordered an external company, in this case Deloitte, to make this kind of study of our impact both in companies and uh, society. And they have uh, determined that for every euro invested by a company in R&D with us, about 12 euros is produced in its income statement. So from one euro to 12 euros. And every job position in Tecnalia, six, more than six other jobs are kept in the Basque country. This is the impact over the companies, over the, the industry. And technology of research has a real impact on society and provides specific solutions to the major global changes, challenges. About the social impact of our activities, also in this study of uh, Deloitte, for every euro invested in the past quality institutions in technology, a GDP of 24 is generated, from 1 euro to 24. And in terms of taxes, for every euro invested by past public institutions in Tecnalia, a tax return of almost three euros is generated. So in terms of taxes, one euro, three euros are returned. And I, must, I, I, I am insisting very much in Basque government because, as you will see soon, the Basque government is the main public funder of the activity. <coughs> we have a more or less total income of 120 million, about the 50% from private contracts, about the 21 from non-competitive funding, and the 32 competitive public funding. And now you will see this more or less 50% coming from private contracts, from Europe, from this kind of projects, about the 23 percent of our total income from the past government, both competitive and non-competitive funding, about the 29 percent, and all the institutions about 1 percent. So you, must, you can see now uh, the role of the past government in our activity. Okay. Of course, we are also in the rest of Spain, we have uh, many clients in the rest of Spain, many clients abroad, but our main founder is a uh, uh, vast government. And we are organized in different scopes of action, uh, independently of the business areas or the business units we are organized on. And we work mainly in six different scopes, energy transition, health, sustainable mobility, smart manufacturing, urban ecosystem, and digital transformation. In our division, we work mainly in this energy transition and also in urban ecosystem, but also in um, sustainable mobility and industry. 
So in energy transition, we work with uh, renewable energies, smart grids and storage, positive energy buildings and districts. We are talking probably about this in this uh, project. Uh, hydro hydrogen, the digitization of energy, and so on. In urban ecosystem, smart eco materials, smart buildings, energy buildings and cities, resilience and climate change, and urban and territorial transformation. Sustainable mobility, smart manufacturing, digital transformation, and personalized health. You can see more or less the six main vectors of uh, research and development in whole Europe. At this moment, we are constructing also a new strategy about circular economy, which will be the seventh uh, prioritized line in science technology. Okay, and we have three different models of uh, relationship of three different business models inside Technaria. Laboratory services, R&D innovation projects, and development of investment opportunities. About uh, 250 people working on laboratory services, uh, electrical services, fire, uh, materials, health development, pharma, development. Um, this kind of activity has a very oriented uh, client and service uh, approach. Second model is R&D and innovation projects and we have different teams. The, 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 the business of the testing and the certification is quite different from development of new products, materials, and solutions. So we have different teams. The second one and the main one is R&D and innovation projects. And finally, we have also a line where our own research is transformed in other kind of uh, business opportunities, mainly the generation of startups or spin-offs. We are very active in the creation of uh, startups. We, we think that it's another way, an important way, to create uh, value around us in terms of uh, employment. We work more or less with uh, 9,000 clients around Spain and uh, mainly in Europe, and the 73% are small and medium companies. About the 27 are large companies, but our organization is very focused in this kind of small and medium companies. That is more or less the profile of the companies in the Basque Country and also in the rest of Spain. As I have said before, we are a private company with a, a form of a foundation, a private foundation, where 24 of our patrons are companies. Also, we have institutional trustees, with 11 uh, people coming from the Basque government, the general state Spanish administration, and so on. Eight appointed trustees and six numerary trustees. This is, uh, these are our patrons of our foundation. And finally, we are very active in European projects. In fact, we are the first company, the first uh, private organization in Spain in project contracting, participating on a leadership in Euro, uh, European Horizon 2020 program, and the 13th in whole of Europe. In terms of the balance of the Horizon 2020, we have led about uh, 76 projects. We have contracted 472, and uh, we have collaborated with about uh, 600 Spanish companies in these projects. This is more or less a very brief scope of uh, what Technalia is and our objectives. I would like to insist in the idea of the impact. We work mainly for uh, the generation of impact both in companies and industries and in uh, the whole society. Okay, <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Luis, for the presentation, for the nice presentation, Technalia. And um, 
Well, uh, I have to say that for the people who are online, uh, you can write uh, your questions in the PR, uh, P and R menu. Uh, you should find there in the teams, so you can write your questions there. I'm going to wait just one minute if someone wants to, to make some questions to Jose Luis. It seems they are not. Uh, I guess they told me that they, they are not uh, able to write the chat. Ah, okay. No, not in the chat, but in the PNR menu. Yeah, the, the chat is, is enabled. It's well, or in English, QA, it depends on. <laughs> yeah, I have it to the teams in Spanish, maybe I see the PNR, but uh, in English, QA. Okay, I think there are no questions, so let's move to uh, the next talk. That will be given by Julen Astudillo. Julen is one of our colleagues here in Technalia. He's expert in, in facades and building industry. And he's going to talk about uh, the reasons why we can use uh, the, the BIPV, the Building Integrated Photovoltaics. So, Julen, go ahead. You can, you can be here or there, either as you want. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, good morning. So, uh, this, uh, well, I'm Julian Studio, also from Technalia. Uh, my field of knowledge is more related to construction and uh, facade. So, I am going to give you some uh, remarks about why we think that it's interesting to use photovoltaic in building. That probably is something that all of you know, but uh, I want to give you some uh, facts about uh, this, which is the energy and economic impact of using this and what is happening now in Spain and in Europe. So, to how this is interesting from the business point of view. So, uh, we think that uh, using photovoltaic in the envelope is interesting. Uh, because, uh, okay, there is a lot of things that need to be done uh, in this uh, field of knowledge. There are many things that can be developed in order to integrate better the photovoltaic in buildings. We think that uh, uh, also uh, now we are in a uh, demanding period with a requirement to introduce renewables in, the, in many fields of work and mainly in buildings in order to achieve this type of buildings that are zero energy buildings or positive buildings. This is something that we have a big request now from the market. Uh, we need to increase the cell consumption in residential buildings and in the industry and the, in, the, in the different uh, uh, fields of work that we have in the economy. And uh, what we are seeing now because of the war in Ukraine and other things that are happening is that it's important uh, to have your own energy because what is happening with energy at the end in Europe is quite complicated and we are seeing that the prices are rise a lot. And also we have another request from the European Commission and also from the market to reduce the CO2 in uh, all, the, uh, all the work related to construction uh, from the manufacturing to the operation of the, of the building. So what is happening with the, with the market? And these are some numbers that I extracted uh, uh, from uh, different uh, uh, studies. Is what is happening with the cell consumption in uh, Europe? So we can see that uh, countries like Germany, they have two millions of households that, has, uh, that are now using this uh, photovoltaic in, the, in their buildings. In the United Kingdom, we have around uh, 800,000, Italy 600,000. And okay, one of the reasons that I put this picture here for Spain is that in Spain, one of the countries with more hours of sun, at the end, we have more or less the lower values in Europe of using photovoltaic in residential construction. 
So we can say, okay, Germany, they have uh, a GPD higher than us, so they have more possibilities to install photovoltaic on, on their buildings. The issue is that if you, we see countries like Vietnam, uh, they installed in the last year nine gigawatts of uh, photovoltaic for buildings only in one year. And the total amount that Spain has on all the history is to 0.3 gigawatts of installed energy. So it's not related to uh, the amount of, of the budget that you have. It's probably a little different because of the public uh, uh, request or the possibilities to access to the energy that, that you have. Australia, a company, a, a country similar to us, they installed in the last years four gigawatts of energy. Only in two or three years. And China, okay, China is quite different from us. They installed in the last years 27 gigawatts. So we are seeing the difference that we have from Asia to uh, European countries. So I, uh, I have made a little exercise here. Uh, that later you can check uh, if you don't see the numbers quite well uh, about what is happening or what can be done related to use photovoltaics in the envelope in the roof or in the buildings. So if we take the average construct, uh, electricity consumption in a dwelling in Spain, we see that more or less they uh, use uh, 3,200 uh, uh, kilowatts uh, per year of electricity. More or less this is the amount of electricity that they use in Spain per year. And it's divided in this, uh, with this structure. So the electricity, this, uh, this amount, is the 35% of the total consumption of energy in a Spanish uh, home. Then we have natural gas, oil products, renewable energies is only the 70%, coal in order to sum the 100% of energy sources that we have in, in Spain. So we can see that the electricity is the 35%, and the natural gas and other products is the 46%. This is more or less the structure that we have. And then if we, if we go to see which is the total consumption according to services, we can see that, okay, heating is 47%, domestic hot water 80%, okay, the kitchen, the cooking things 7%, cooling, this number, lighting 4%, household appliances 19%, and the steinmal products, the two, 2.3%. So we can see that more or less, uh, according to services, the electricity is the 34%, and the heating and domestic hot water, heating, cooling, domestic hot water is the 66%. Uh, so now, with the system that we have and using photovoltaics, what we can see is that uh, we can go to this 34% that is more or less similar the entire year, because it's not depending about heating and cooling. It's more related to uh, these other components like cooking, cooling, lighting, electrical appliance, standby, etc. So, if we make a little exercise of what, what we need to install on a building in order to cover this energy consumption, we can see that, uh, as an example of here for the Basque Country, Sevilla in the south of Spain, a lot of sun, Berlin and Helsinki, uh, we can see if we install uh, 1.8 uh, uh, kilowatts uh, of photovoltaics with around four panels with this surface, we can obtain this energy uh, in these different places. If we install uh, 17 square meters of uh, photovoltaic panels, we can obtain this one. And if we install 33%, 30, 33 square meters, we can obtain these amounts. What we can cover with these amounts. So if we go to each of these places, we see what uh, is going to be uh, produced each of the months. And we divide this average consumption per month in order to have an average. I understand that this number is not quite, uh, 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 quite uh, exact, but as the electricity consumption is more or less the same across the year, because we are not talking about heating and cooling, we can say that more or less this is what we are going to obtain. 
and taking into account the, the placement of where we are going to install the photovoltaic panels and the amounts that we have in this column, we have the lower installation, the midi, middle installation, and uh, an installation with uh, a lot of photovoltaics. We can see these columns for each of the uh, placement across Europe. We can see that in the Basque country, installing uh, this 3.68 uh, kilowatts, we can cover almost all the electricity that we need in a year, apart from the uh, months in winter. And installing this part, we are going to uh, have the electricity for all the, all the year without problems. In Sevilla, uh, at the end, uh, okay, installing this, this amount, we cover the entire, the entire year, and installing this lower installation, uh, at the end we, okay, we have some months that uh, we are going not to reach the demand that we have from the, from the house. In Berlin, okay, we have a little worse uh, behavior, but we can see that with this we can obtain a lot of energy across the year. And in Helsinki, okay, what happened is that it's more or less similar to if we install this amount to Berlin and to the Basque country, and we can obtain more or less, and you can see here, more or less than the amount of energy that we can obtain in an average way per year. So what we are seeing is that, okay, with installation like this one that are not a lot of square meters, we are able to cover a lot of the energy from the electricity point of view that is required from a building. Also, uh, this is an exercise using uh, uh, one tool that is provided by the European Commission. Here we can see for the Basque country, which is the amount of energy that we are generating uh, during the different months of the year with a, in an installation in a roof with a 20, 20 degrees of angle and in an installation of a facade. So we can see that there are not a lot of difference between the installation in the roof and in the facade and also the installation in the facade, uh, we have a, 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 a curve that covers better the winter, the winter months. So we can use a BAPB installed in a roof and in a facade to cover the electricity that we need across the year and some electricity that can be used for heating and cooling purposes. So, okay, this is a simple exercise, but it's in order to give you that, okay, installation of photovoltaic in the facade is also quite important. Also some numbers related to the amount of market, the amount of buildings that we have in Spain and that can be similar in other countries in Europe. So we have around 6 million of single family dwellings and uh, almost 2 million of multifamily housing with 14 million of the ways to provide this number of, of buildings, 8 million of buildings in total in Spain and 20 million of the weddings. With this, what we can say is that the average the wedding per multifamily building is around seven. So for this multifamily housing, we have around seven buildings. And for each of these uh, uh, the weddings, if we install these 70 square meters to cover the, the middle of the of the columns that I saw you before, we are able to cover this electricity that is required by the building. And with 130 square meters of photovoltaic, we are able to cover almost the uh, amount of electricity that is required by a building. Also, we need to take into account that uh, the cost of installing this uh, electricity can be around 5,000 euros, depending on the country, depending on the, the, the system but you can have a return of investment quite fast, less than five years. And also we need to take into account that there are many helps now from the public sector that can uh, help us in order to reduce this, uh, uh, the cost of the installation. And also we need to take into account that used photovoltaic in facade is also quite important because, okay, for this type of buildings, probably it's not so important to install the photovoltaic in the, in the facade, but for these type of buildings that are quite common in Spain and in other countries in Europe, at the end you don't have any, you don't have space in the roof to install with the better inclination in order to obtain all the performance from the photovoltaic. So some tools uh, are required in order to use 
the specific facades in order to have uh, okay, more space to produce this energy. So in Technalia, in my team, and in collaboration with also the colleagues from the photovoltaic team, uh, okay, we are trying to improve the way that photovoltaic is used in buildings. What we want is this, but with a better integration in the building. So you can see here uh, a person that has included photovoltaic in the facade, photovoltaic in the roof. Okay, uh, it's something interesting, but the idea is to integrate better in the building this photovoltaic, to improve the way that photovoltaic is used and uh, pro uh, provide different appliances in order to uh, uh, make better this, uh, this system. So we are collaborating with some companies, some of them are here, in order to include better the photovoltaic in, in, the, in the building. So this is a, a project that we are now working on, where what we propose is to cover the building with an industrialized system, with a mesh, that this mesh allow us to include different renewable technologies without problems. So photovoltaics, a VAPV cladding module, hybrid uh, photovoltaic, so thermal and photovoltaic, also solar collectors, we have insulation, there are thermal batteries. Okay, we are able to include many different components in the facade and in the roof without problems. And also something quite important for BioPV is how you manage the, the energy. So there are many uh, digital tools that uh, provide to the users uh, uh, how to manage the energy in the best way possible. So at the end, there is a combination between physical components and uh, digital uh, components. Another line that we are working on is how can we make a, a facade uh, that can be uh, uh, improved uh, and use a more simple facade depending on the, your economic possibilities to a more complicated facade. Here, what we are proposing is also a modular industrialized system that allows us to integrate different uh, technologies, photovoltaic, hybrid, heating and cooling, uh, recycled uh, components, also using some uh, materials uh, that are better for the ecologi ecological point of view, such like a bio-based uh, profiles, not aluminium, not metal, bio-based. And here what we propose is a facade with only uh, the integration of photovoltaic, a facade that also can provide heating and cooling across the facade, connected to the heat pump in the building, a facade with, uh, <coughs> um, a facade with uh, hybrid panels that can collaborate also with the photovoltaic in order to produce energy and domestic hot water and a facade that also use all these components but uh, with automated uh, ventilation windows in order to improve the interior air quality. So this is more or less another project. This, in this project also we connect the building with the surroundings because of, uh, we are using uh, batteries coming from cars and uh, uh, recycle batteries in order to connect these batteries to the building and be able to see uh, how we can improve the uh, behavior of the building across the day and across the year. So with this we connect different buildings, we have a building management system in order to manage all the energy and we have a district management system in order to manage the production and use of the energy across the day in buildings with different uh, profiles and also the system, the modular system in the facade that allow us to use the, 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 the energy of the, the, the photovoltaic system in a better way. And another, uh, another line that we are working on with our, that are working our colleagues, this is something that you can see in this building in the, in the back part that probably is going to be explained later by my companies, by my uh, partners. So here what uh, they are working on is on improve the photovoltaic itself. So to uh, make the photovoltaic with high flexibility, high performance, long-term reliability and the aesthetic. So uh, now we are, they are checking uh, this photovoltaic in this building in order to see what is happening and how we can manage also this energy. So this is a proof that uh, they are doing in order to integrate photovoltaic in the system. So they, they are different lines that we are working on 
in order to check which is the best possibility, the best approach to use photovoltaic in the system from the component, from the material, from the digital point of view in order to manage uh, all these elements. So in order to finish, uh, what we want with our developments in Technalia in collaboration with other companies is to integrate uh, these systems specifically for the buildings, not as a, a something that we put outside the building, but design it in order to be integrated in a good way in the in the in the building itself. Also, we are using solutions for electricity, heating and cooling, and domestic hot water. At the end, the use of photovoltaics and other components can, can cover all the amount of energy required by the building, not only the 35% that we saw for Spain, but also the 60% that also can be covered by, uh, for heating and cooling. We use this, uh, we propose to use this also in the envelope, not only in the roof. The envelope is a, 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 a space of the building with a lot of possibilities and uh, okay within that this area of the building is going to be used uh, as much as possible in the next years because we have this requirement from the energy point of view we propose modular industrialized solutions in order to improve refurbishing because we need to take into account that refurbishing is a high market in europe now we are uh, working on the 0.2 of the total ratio of buildings in europe and we have a requirement to refurbish the 75% because all this 75% of the buildings in Europe now they don't have a good behavior in terms of energy. So this is something that we need to do. And okay, you see that there are a lot of space here to reach this amount. And uh, all these solutions can be used in residential, that is the example that I show you, but also in tertiary buildings, office buildings like this one that can use the energy uh, in order to reduce their uh, uh, the payment that they have for electricity. Well, thanks, Julian, for the talk, the nice talk. And um, well, if there are any questions? I'm going to check if there are questions online. Yeah, so um, online, yeah, uh, Agustina Saro is uh, asking Do you know uh, why the installation? and use of PV is so low or slow in Europe? Is this due to the cost, government policies or what? If the trend is, uh, if the trend is to increase the use of uh, sustainable and alternative energy, why is the traction for Europe so slow? Well, I have to say, first of all, that this is something that we have already uh, talked about in, in the prior uh, meetings that we have had in this international group. Why is moving so slow? I don't know, uh, Julian, if, if you want uh, to, to add something. I think that uh, there are many, uh, many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, from the point of view of the public authorities at the end, I think that we don't have the... Maybe the you can come here because the micro is here. We don't have the, 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 the requirement from the, the governments. Uh, we now are starting to work more in this type of solution because the cost of energy increased 10 times uh, in the last year. So it's quite, uh, uh, now you are, we are seeing on our uh, invoices every month that uh, something like this is needed. Probably we don't have so many solutions in order to integrate photovoltaic in, in, in the buildings. Now they are beginning to appear more and more solutions. It's starting to be more easy to use this type of, uh, this type of solution. And I can say in Spain, uh, we have many problems if we, you want to install uh, uh, photovoltaic in your building. You need to agree with the rest of the people that are living in your building. You need to have some uh, permission from the town hall. You need to, okay, now is a difficult moment because all the people are, or many people want to, to use this type of systems. And still, I think that in Spain, we don't have this uh, uh, requirement to use photovoltaic elements or to use produce our own energy still uh, we think that this is something that needs to come from the outside so many things need to be done from 
uh, here from the owner point of view, the companies and the governments. It's a complicated Thank you. Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite complicated. Yes, <coughs> as I said, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we are also discussing a lot about this. Yeah, and I think uh, well, the the question was focused on in Europe, but uh, I would say that uh, could be different depending on the countries. <laughs> There are some countries where the penetration is higher and some others where the penetration is lower. By the way, I haven't said that, uh, well, as, uh, as you see, uh, this, this workshop is in English because there are international people here. But uh, if someone you do not feel comfortable with English and you want to ask a question in Spanish, we can translate or, I mean, I don't want the, that the language, uh, it's a barrier here. So at the end, the purpose of this workshop is that you can solve the questions that you may have regarding the integration of photovoltaics in buildings so, I mean, feel free to, to talk in Spanish if you want and we can translate it. Yeah, Rebecca, do you want to say something? Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about um, the module and industrialized solution for uh, Could you please explain that? Because for integrating a lot of products are customized. So, when you talk about modular, etc., well, I'm going to say just yes, uh, for uh, for the people online that uh, haven't heard Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca asked for the modular solution that uh, Julian was proposing. So how it can be uh, practiced, use or yeah, go ahead, the, the idea that we have with this modular solution is that okay, sometimes when we talk about refurbishing, everything needs to be adapted specifically for each of the buildings. So what happens there is that the cost of installation of these solutions is quite big because every solution needs to be specifically for that building. So in that project, what we are doing is, okay, can we obtain many information uh, from the building in a digital way? So laser scanner, this type of elements, create a model of the building, try to improve the solution that we are going to apply to the building and base, uh, combining this digital approach with an industrialized solution, uh, a modular with some kind of flexibility, trying to merge of, uh, these two approaches and propose for a building something almost automatically, uh, a solution almost automatically, based on uh, systems that we have in the in the tool. So this is something that is quite complex. This is an European project that we are now uh, working on. And, uh, okay, uh, we are going to start uh, applying these solutions to a specific a bit, a specifically buildings uh, in the next year. So, okay, this is something that is in an ongoing process, it's complicated, but we think that in some way we need to reduce the amount of solutions for each of the buildings, because if not, uh, it's going to be quite difficult. Okay, thank you, Julian. Well, I think, uh, well, another applause for Julian. We have to move to the next speaker. And well, first of all, uh, because I don't know why I cannot share this PPT. The presentation of Cal. Well, um, I have to say that uh, Cal. Um, it's an architect from, from Switzerland. He has uh, his own studio there, which is called uh, Bididen and Partners. And actually, Bididen and Partners is uh, one of the most important, I would say, uh, architectural studies related with uh, solar design of architecture. Uh, they have received several awards uh, related with solar architecture. And well, uh, it's an honor to, to, to have you here. So please, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Daniel mentioned, Bidden and Partner, I founded 32 years ago. We are doing uh, planning, realization, but also R&D work in several topics and consulting. And for our R&D work, uh, we needed uh, owner, ownership, a real estate company. And so I founded one 20 years ago, which we um, renovate project. Some of them I show here uh, are with our company Eco Renova. Um, I show you a development from the last 12 years with photovoltaic in the facade, where we started and what possibility we have now all together 
but I can also show you some figures and looking back uh, that it pays out to pay for a PV facade, a PV in the facade. Starting with this old building, 1960, uh, that's close to the Lake of Constance in Switzerland, uh, we bought a house to the left, a house who has to be renovated, and there we placed a PV facade, like you see the picture to the right. We planned or start planning in 2009, 2010, and finished the work in 2012. The difficulties at that time was that we only had norm models where we had to place in an existing facade. And whoever builds and renovated, or those people know, of course, it's very difficult to renovate an existing building. You never know how or what uh, is appearing. So one hand, the first step as an owner is to create more space if you can. So larger up the building to gain more uh, space to rent out. And you see here the red, uh, flat, uh, the red space where we extended the building uh, up on the ground floor. So we extended in the end from the first to the top floor, rather about 50% of the area. And so we could rent out more space and could invest also the money in the PV facade itself. Looking now at this facade, it looks very easy. 95% of the facade is covered with the norm model. But of course, the balustrades, the, the ceilings was different in each floor. So we had to figure out a system how we can use these equal uh, high panels of equal height that it looks constant and uh, goes up with all the windows. So we had to push the windows a bit, uh, the, the balustrade and the uh, so things up above. So then we had always the same heights of the window and the same widths. This is energy flow diagram, and I would recommend not only the architect to deal with it, but also the owner, because this is the key element if you want to uh, survive now, say a bit special, um, because we got on the left hand side the energy you have to buy from outside into the plot of the land. And since I founded my company 30 years ago, we always try to avoid to buy energy from countries like Russia, Libya, non-renewable energy. We always done that in our renovation and those owners are now quite happy and uh, comfortable with the situation now. But on the other hand, we also try to reduce this energy on the left side, what we buy in, to reduce this amount. And to get a small amount, we had to look at the right side. This is the energy we are using in the building. So these flows going out, these are the energy, for example, for the heating or the water, the warm water consumption, or the blue one, the light. And to say the bit point, uh, to say the bit uh, yeah, special, we don't want to have a heating. We want to have 20 degrees or 23 degrees in the flat, but we don't want to have heating actually. We want to have more space in the cellar. So our goal is actually to get the 23 degrees and to avoid the heating. We couldn't manage it until yeah, now, but still that's our goal actually. So if we do it this way, we want to have the light, but we don't want to have any lamps. We want to have a, a bright room and try to do that with a, a most less energy uh, as possible. And that's why we use quite a little amount of energy. We insulate the buildings quite highly. You don't see it from outside, but normally the U value is far behind or below 0 0.1 or even less on the facade and the roof even lesser. Then on the bottom there are the losses. We try to do a system where you have really a little losses and keep the energy as much as possible in the house, recover it, for example, the heat, uh, the air ventilation system is heat recovery. That helps us to save as low energy as possible. And then on the top, this energy we like to use. That's how the gain, the free gains from outside. The blue one, that's the PV coming from, uh, from the sun for free, actually. Uh, the air for the heat pump, but also active and passive solar gains and the humans living in the building with this energy will deal. So in the end, this project produces the same amount of energy like it consumes for heating, warm water, cooking and lighting and everything together. So that's why we received the 
Swiss and even the European solar price 19, uh, 2013 for this renovation project, and we're still maintaining it nowadays. We have now more than 10 years production, uh, and we have really a stable profit. That's really interesting, this uh, project or this building. Uh, in the balance sheet, we have uh, 350,000 Swiss francs, more or less the same like in Europe. Um, and we have an annual re revenue from nearly 19,000 Swiss francs. <laughs> this is uh, with a feed-in tariff of uh, 35 or 36 euro cents. So I think it's more or less the same now like you have it in San Sebastian with the new uh, price of electricity. So taking away the depreciation within 25 years, uh, the maintenance, so cleaning the facade all six or seven years, uh, we get an annual profit of 4,000 Swiss francs. This gives, uh, gives us an uh, annual return of 2.3% in the first 25 years. But the uh, facade itself, it lasts, of course, longer. We think it can last for 50 years. We don't know how much energy will produce after it, but after that, the golden time will start because the facade will cost one franc. And after this, all the energy is completely again. So this annual average return can climb quite a much higher in the end. As I mentioned, it's a really constant production. In spite of the sun, where is it's plus and minus three, four percent deviation, and really a good way to handle this income of the costs. The next project we made for a company. An innovative, uh, innovative company in Switzerland that's the headquarter of Plumrock producing rock wool as an insulation material. As they produce this material, they also want to save as much energy as possible. We plant this headquarter with photovoltaics also in the facade, 400 square meters in the facade, 400 square meters on the roof, and could make with this a plus energy building for an office building. And that's more difficult because the office uses more energy than the tenants in a flat. And it was very successful, this project. And uh, here we took a PV facade, a thin film, that's a further development because we want to meet the architect in Switzerland who doesn't like to see the photovoltaic modules uh, like it is in natural. It's okay in the roof, you can cover it with uh, the, the side and you don't see the roof anymore but you can't cover it in the facade. So with this model, we had a black facade, the Rüstung here in this uh, area with the PV modules. And if you've got a 50 meter long building, it's quite easy to place this facade within this building. And this construction was even cheaper than taking another material because you gain energy from it. Um, the facade section to the left, Coming from outside, you don't see the thick insulation, but it's more than 30 centimeter insulation. In the north, it's normal, but for Switzerland, it's uh, quite a lot. Um, it's far off the regulation. And very important is that you get a fixing, which you don't lose this energy again, the energy gains. So it is uh, a fixing, uh, which is uh, made out of uh, kind of a plastic, so you don't get, get any energy flowing out. Um, you see the same film, cadmium-free cells uh, with 140 watt power per square meter. Now, why the facade? Uh, now here we have two different types of photovoltaic modules. We have uh, the normal ones on the roof with uh, crystalline uh, cells. We have the same film in the facade, so the maximal uh, production is at the facade around about a half than uh, on the roof. But still, in spite of that, we have a higher production or nearly the same high production from uh, November, December, January and February. And these, in this time, it's difficult for Switzerland to have the energy. So we have to find ways to gain energy in these winter months where we sometimes even have snow on the roof. And this is the way to gain it over the facade. If you would have the same models, the same quality of models in the facade, you would even have 
the same production in March, or more or less the same in March and October at the facade, like you get it on the roof. Only on the roof, we got then in the summer the big peak, and that's why we have in the yearly production the higher amount. The next project is a foundry project of the CFO, uh, CFOE in Switzerland. It's a lighthouse project. We went a step further. In 2015 or 14, the planning started. We wanted to have a PV facade, which you don't recognize that it could be even PV itself. And it was really a great development with the industry partners from Austria producing these PV modules and take coming with us on the way. It was a hard discussion, by the way, to convince the PV industry to cover the PV with a glass and a color because they say you lose some energy. You lose energy, it's ridiculous. I said, what's, what does it bother you? Nobody plays it in the facade because it doesn't look nice. If you reduce the energy gain for 20, 30 percent, but everybody is using this kind of facade, you gain much more and can change the energy uh, production in Switzerland or in Austria. So he came with us and made this project. By the way, to the right, the building before, to the left after it, again, he extended this building, raised up two floors, uh, two floors, yeah, eight flats, and it was really a difficult building with a difficult shape to solve the problem with photovoltaics. Again, we had windows, which was placed already years ago, but in this case, we had 18 different types of models, 18 different sizes, but it was uh, around about 1,700 models in total uh, to place on this facade. In the end, that was the first prototype in April 2016. We invited 120 architects uh, in within two days. Uh, to ask them, do you see what the material there is? Of course, they know it from the invitation, it must be photovoltaics. But many of these architects were also passing by before, days before, and they said to me, well, I didn't realize that it was photovoltaic, but I was wondering what kind of material this could be. First, I thought it was ethanol, but then still it wasn't shiny, but it didn't look like ethanol. So he was really wondering what kind of material it is, and I liked it very much. So this was a step where the architect realized this is a material which I can deal with in my design, with my project. And they were really happy about that. And it was a successful project uh, goal we reached with this, that the architect didn't, didn't realize it and don't see the um, pro, uh, monocrystalline cells underneath. You can go very close, you hardly, or you don't see it. The under 20 architect didn't see it. What did we do? We took a glass glass model together with uh, TVP photovoltaics in Austria, uh, now Kyoto, and uh, we covered them with different percentage of the color. So you see, you don't see it very well here in the picture, bit enough. But to the left, it is 100% coverage, 80, 60, and 50%. And 50, 60%, we could see from a distance. So my partner, office partner, and I could see from a, a distance from 20 meters, we could see the cell. The normal person who didn't know it so, saw it from five, five meters. So the problem was we knew it, and that's why we could see it. Um, and that was the reason that we took more, a higher coverage, but we also get a higher losses through that. But again, it was important to convince the architect to use a material which looking like a colored glass. So that's why we took the 80% coverage in the end, uh, which you hardly could see the under construction, the, the cells below, and then we had a reduction of power only by 20%. To the right, this is the picture how we connected these uh, glass models together. It's an optimizer system where we got small groups and each model itself gives the power to the grid or to the, the house itself. It's a self-consumption. Uh, with this system, we can use it even sometimes a shadow on one model or not. 
And that's very important in the facade and a difficult task to, to deal with. In this case, it was more difficult uh, to have a, uh, a rich return because it was really a great uh, development with quite a high cost over years. I didn't tell me, we visited quite a lot of company in Europe, uh, six companies, and in the end, one was finally able to do it, but this was two years planning on the way to get to this, this product. It looks quite easy in the end, but it was very, very difficult. So we had uh, 600,000 costs for the PV construction itself uh, and the electricity in the balance sheet, the annual uh, renew, renew, the depreciation within 25 years, the maintenance again, the cleaning around about all five, six, seven years. We get an average return of 1.5%. That's quite low, but at that time in Switzerland was great because you had to pay money if you put the money on the bank. We had negative uh, interest on the bank account. So the golden years we have here only for five years. In this case, Ecorinova is the contractor of the facade. So we don't own the whole building, we only own the facade and contracting it together with the uh, and the, the building itself is owned by a private person. After, after 30 years, we give the facade back to the owner. But still, it was a very important project for us, and we learned uh, very much. And in the end, we didn't lose money, we gained a bit. Here again, the TV facade, it's very important for the energy production. That's a nice summer day to left the total of the energy production tray, that's the roof, the typical form of the roof, with a peak over lunchtime, and then all the different colors are there for the facade. It's this building at this location with a special situation. So for example, east facade is quite a low production because the mountains give shadow, the neighbor building gives a lot of shadow, and other hand, the west and even the north looks very good, that's due to the situation where the building is standing in <coughs> Zurich. To the right, we took away the roof. It's only the four, four facades. And then you get an interesting figure. You get a peak in the morning and in the afternoon. So we avoid a typical situation what Germany has, for example, in, uh, in summertime. They have a really a really large production of photovoltaics, but the big peak over lunchtime and we put try to put these peaks a bit on the side. And with this, with the PV facade, we can do it. And in total, we have a very nice production line or power through the whole day from eight in the morning to six in the evening. So it's really great also for office building uses this energy directly. Um, that's now more detail how it looks like the, the yield uh, per facade. You see, it's very, very difficult to have a constant production in this facade because of the shadow. One time it's the balcony, one time it's a group of optimizers that are working quite well. Uh, we had to deal quite hard in the first two years with this, and now it works out well. But you see, the green part is a quite a high production we have there, but there are some blue parts due to the shadowing of neighbors of the building itself or the balcony. The goal was here actually to have a, a, a highest um, a possible high uh, self-consumption, uh, not self-sufficiency. We try to be within the whole area with the electric, uh, within the electricity grid itself, but we try to use as much energy we produce ourselves in the building itself. So we had a, the first year without the battery and we could use nearly 39% of the production, of the yearly production. With the battery, we could rise up nearly to 70% of energy we produce. And that's an important aspect also as an investor, because this energy we use in the building, we gain more money than the energy we have to bring back in the grid. Put it in the grid, we get eight euro cents, but using it ourselves, can be the 35 euro cents because we don't pay for the grid, don't pay any taxes, 
for this system itself, this money we can use for the investment. Yeah, here you see the, the battery to the left, 150 kilowatt hour battery, so it's a large battery for the 13 flats. Um, one problem, it appears in the end, this battery consumes quite a lot of energy uh, itself. It's around about 7.5% uh, of the produced energy is due to the efficiency and losses in the battery gun. So money we lose actually, but still, if you look at an average return of 1.5%, you can invest uh, 94,000 Swiss francs for a kind of a battery like this. <coughs> and it costed us 100,000, so we were quite close to it. Again, we had to do it for the CFO Lighthouse project. That's why we placed the battery inside. With this project, we also uh, plan with our partner to go in the color. So these are the four modules in 2016 where we showed up that we can even build or make projects with colored facade. That was in an early stage already six years ago. And this was the start for the next project or the last project I present you. It's the first time in our history or in our 32 years that we demolish, uh, take away an old building and replace it through a new building. Otherwise, we renovated over 100 buildings the last 32 years. Um, but this case, it was in a bad condition and we had a bigger potential to make more uh, space with a new building. So before it looks like the left and to the right, that's the new project uh, with four flats like before per uh, storage above, per floor, but uh, larger one and uh, nicer ones. Here we produce the facade completely in the in the with a prefabrication, incl uh, including the, the back rails or the, the under rails on the construction itself. And within one or two days, the place the whole facade with the highly insulated construction. And, and the next day, you only have to place the PV models itself on it. But before we could have PV models, it was a difficult task with the owner. The owner's wish was a cheerful, a happy facade. I will ask you architects in here, what color does a happy facade have? Well, in the end, in our case, it was a kind of an orange uh, they wanted to have. So we went to our clients, uh, to our uh, partners, again, six to seven uh, uh, industry TV production in Europe, asked if you could make an orange example. They said, no problem, we will do that. Uh, after half a year, half a year, we had to stop. Nobody could do or make a PV model with an orange we like to have. So if that's a difficult color. In spite of uh, these tables we have here in our office from the partners, with more or less all the color to reach exactly this color we would like to have, it's nearly impossible. So we changed our concept. We had then the gray and red, the red facade on the north as an entrance facade, and the gray east, south and west. There are four companies with their examples. You see some differences, but still there are many companies in Europe able to do facades like this. And in the end, this is the product, product, uh, project finished. That's the company Schweizer. You all may know and Schweizer in Switzerland who uh, made this facade and was also part of the ownership of the building. So everything with PV and on the top of the roof, the old fashioned way uh, with the PV on the roof. But the main energy is coming here from the facade. So that's the last picture with the old buildings we renovated by with PV and the future project we are working on. Uh, the topic is actually we try to place PV more or less everywhere where it's possible in our buildings. But in the end, nobody recognizes anymore. Uh, that's PV. So. Well, thank you, Carl, for the nice presentation and well, these nice projects integrating PV. Yeah, that uh, they, they, well, they, the, it's not possible to see the PV most of them, and this is the rest. Other questions to Carl?
going to check the online questions. It seems there are no questions. Well, I have a question to, to Carl. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, which, which uh, if there are special, I mean, you have uh, shown uh, successful business models in this kind of buildings. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, tell us some uh, tips or requirements that you need uh, in order to uh, do this uh, be, to do this business successful. I mean, if you uh, require some specific type of buildings or some specific uh, uh, areas uh, in which, uh, for instance, you need uh, that the uh, the cost of the building is higher than on other places. Do you have some uh, yes in this sense? Well, as we are founded 20 years ago, we were mm. we were a small company at the beginning. I think a very important point is to deal with the risks. Mm. So we always try out to figure out what are the costs if you fail. Uh, is it a hundred thousand? Is a half a million? Is a million? And can we carry this failure? So for a big ownership, it's actually no problem to take one building from the portfolio and start to make a project like this. And to be honest, always something doesn't work out. It's like a normal building project. Always, always something happens. <coughs> but the better you can deal with it, the better you can plan with it. And the clearer the goal is from the owner, I want it, then you get it in the end. <laughs> you really have to focus on it and stay on it and uh, yeah, in the end, it costs perhaps a bit more, but you have to uh, deal with that. And after it, the second and third project, we can <coughs> it. and it has to pay out because we, we are doing it. And so everybody else can do it itself. But the first one, the first step is most time the difficult one. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, Jose Marik has also yes. another question. Uh, uh, how did you deal with the fire uh, requirements? Ah, well, uh, I can say, uh, Jose Mari is asking for the fire requirements. Did, did yeah. you have to deal with fire requirements? Yeah, in, yeah. yeah we had to deal, but uh, this question my partner has to ask. <laughs> He's for the construction sites and these details, yeah, but he was a topic, of course. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to build this building, uh, you need to have a client that is convinced to use photovoltaic, or you convince that? Because sometimes, and my understanding is that we need to combine the client that, okay, if you use photovoltaic, it's going to be good for you at the end, but uh, the market is not so used. As I mentioned, we have the real estate company, and with this company, we try out things the first time. So it's a connection with our architecture office. So we take our risk ourselves, and then we have the experience for the clients. That's the first part. And the other one is, of course, the problem is you have to convince the architects in the end. Not everybody has a red card or uh, us to build it. Huh? Many architects are afraid about it and want, don't want it. That's why I say it's very important for a client to say, I want it. Even the architects know it's not possible. Huh? So then yeah, either you have to change the team, the architect, or perhaps it's really not possible. But uh, that's actually the most important part. So actually, the first on yourself if you can do that uh, take the experience there so that's the best way for clients working with us they know we've done it already so they don't take so many risks anymore it's always easier to take somebody who done it already okay thank you Carl. let's move to the next speaker yeah, you can use. Well, uh, we have seen uh, <coughs> in the projects from Mividen and Partners that there are some solutions, including uh, color, something like that. And uh, so that in this sense, we have here at uh, Thomas Friesen, who is the CTO of uh, Chromatics. And uh, well, Chromatics is a company who develops this kind of uh, glazing in order uh, so that the PV modules can have this kind of colors. And well, he's going to explain a little bit about these these products. Yes, we try to give some 
Good morning to all. We try to give the colored modules. So we are a company in Switzerland. Uh, it's Comatex. Perhaps someone of you, you know, it's even Swiss Inso. Before it was Swiss Inso. The technology was developed at EPFL in Lausanne in 2010-11. Then they, be, they made a startup. And this uh, technology is a unicolor technology. And the big difference is that the color is not made by pigment, by ceramic coatings, but it's made by, uh, sorry, it's made by interference. You know? So we have no paint, we have no paint, uh, taint of pigments, and it's an atomic deposition in vacuum. You know? And this gives the stability of the color and even uh, less uh, uh, losses for the power. We are now Chromatix. It's a fully integrated company, you know, which we offer the glass, we offer the modules, and we offer even in the future perhaps more the facade uh, mechanical part. This we are building. Uh, so as I said, we 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 made our coating with PVD, which is physical vapor deposition with metal oxides. It's a multilayer. Perhaps you know it from the sunglasses. It's the same principle, so we have no pigments. This means we have a very high solar transmittance, and we lose here only the 12% in the reflection. And depending on the color, we have from 6 to 15% of uh, losses. Uh, because it's a multilayer made of metal oxides, in principle, it's, it's uh, aluminium oxide, titanium oxides, so they are very stable in time. So and we know that the color never changed in the future. So this is an important thing even, because pigments usually when you have UV so on, will change a little bit the color. We can apply this coating for all glazing, all type of glass, and we can use it for the PV and even for soft, uh, solar thermal technologies. The durability of the coating is the same as from the glass. We can have surfaces which are satinated or clear. We have no glare effect if we have opaque surface. And as I said again, it's a no fade of the color. And we have uh, these are the colors we offered in the moment. These are 10 colors from the dark gray, uh, blue, bluish green. Then we have all this orange, brass, and gold. These are 10 fixed colors. Uh, as we heard before, for us it's very difficult to develop a color you know, because it's an interference color. We cannot, uh, how we say, develop it easily on the request of an architect. We have 10 color and you have to choose one. Uh, as I said, we, Chromatix, we are integrated company. We are coating the glass. And this, uh, we, we are coating the glass on 3, 4, and 6 millimeter thickness. Uh, dimensions are from very small, 400 millimeters. Maximum dimension is 2,000, 2.7 meters by 1.7 meters. And we can give, we cut the glass, we grind the glass, and we temper the glass, and then we give it even to model manufacturer. Or the second option that we make directly the model in Switzerland. And here we can use our front glass, back glass, we can go up to 8 millimeters. And the maximum dimension is usually one to two meters for the uh, for the module. No. External suppliers uh, we have only now in the moment we make only with a satination glass. Satinated glass we buy it and then we give it we let it go in Switzerland. And all the rest of the value chain we put in house. Module production it's in. It's very small because we can make only 80, about 80 modules per day. It's very customized. Uh, this are a little bit uh, standard 60 cells modules with the colors. Very important is that we are masking, usually on the PV cells you see the metallic ribbons. We are masking them with black tape in the stringer so that you don't see it. And even the bus bars, you see it usually in the PV modules. Uh, it's black and it's mask. Now, so the, we have a foreign uh, colored front glass. Now then we have the standard uh, EVA. 
then we have our cells with the covered uh, strings, then we have a black EVA to have the reflection, and then we use a back glass. If we don't use uh, here the black EVA, uh, this is not seen very well, obviously you have the reflection only on this cell, and this is then even uh, the rest of the modular is transparent, and then you see only the color on the cells. This in the moment is quite interesting for balustrades or other overlaying systems. So I show you a little bit examples you know, from architects because here this is a facet with tilted modules, so you have different uh, aspects of the color depending of the of your angle of view. Then you can have very uniform facets. And then you can mix it up how the architect wants to do it. These are three examples. And then we can even make like this one uh, special shades or special forms. Of course, we are very customized. We can do this in different colors or as you want. Uh, now some references in the in the years. This I think it's the most uh, known project in Copenhagen from the international school. It's quite big because it was uh, 12,000 solar panels. Uh, this you see it very well. And this we finished last year. It was a, nice, a small project, but very nice. Even it was given a renovation of a building in Lausanne near the station. And they put, we put here the new modules inside. And I know because we, we are near Lausanne that nobody noticed that this is photovoltaics. Now, this is really nice. We have to say it. Uh, then this is another uh, project in Amsterdam, even quite big with 3,000 square meters. Uh, this is even finished since one year or less even in Zurich at the ETH. Even here we made, before we made a full mock-up. Uh, these are all modules. So even there, even architects they didn't under, saw that this is photovoltaics. Uh, other project in Switzerland, even a nice small project, five, 500 square meters. Uh, yes, this is a Solvis head office. Solvis is a module manufacturer in Croatia who makes the uh, modules for us. This is even a project we just finished in Genoa. Uh, this is under construction and all these are modules. I think it's uh, 600 or 700 modules, very heavy. You know, because this is, uh, modules are here 1.7 meters by 1.5. Very different models because for renovation, this seems all similar, but I think it's 30 or 40 different dimensions we produced. You know, because this is uh, for the renovation, and modules here are about 80, 90 kilograms. So it's really heavy even to produce, and you, you cannot automatize this uh, production. Uh, this is in Singapore. This is an older project made there. And this is another in, in Zurich. So we have quite a lot uh, of projects, and this is some smaller projects we made during the year. So uh, I think we have a lot of projects now, and it's really increasing now the request. <coughs> I think last year at the end we sent out 25,000 square meters of glass, which is quite a big quantity. And sometimes we don't even know where they are going. And uh, my experience now, our experience is a little bit for the color. We can say that uh, in Europe they, they like the gray and the blue. Uh, South America, because we give uh, some glass even to, to Brazil. They like more the blue, green, and all bluish green colors. And Dubai and Emirates, it's always gold and bronze. Okay. 
and mostly for the finishing, they ask for the opac, for the satinated surface. Now they ask sometimes for the brilliant, but there you have the restriction from the reflection from the glare. Now even some architects they want that not that we tape the ribbons, that they want to see the ribbons because they want to show that they are SPV. You know? So even there there are all the different solutions. And for the technology, we are using crystalline silicon and we are using usually always the same cell, which is a Z1 cell with the five pass pass and the same encapsulation materials given for production reason and even for the reason of uh, certification. <coughs> As I said, we are very, uh, I say, customized company. We make it all by hand. It's a whole couture uh, for modules. Uh, but just a little bit our limit, our limits which we have to give to architects. You know, it's given by the tempering oven, which is 2.5 meters by 1.7. Lamination, if we don't use or we have to temper outside, we can make maximum 3 meters by 2. But then it's really a big problem is uh, weight, the handling of the model, the preparation. So we, we try not to do this. And even then the, the design of the models, if you have too much strings and cells inside, you have even electrical problems with diodes and so on. As you see here, we had a project, 81 modules by 31 sizes with all different triangles so on. We can do this, you know, but as it's much better to have more, less, uh, how do you say it? dimensions, you know, because this means in production you need a door, you need a... It's very difficult to handle in production, this means even the price is increasing. And important is even with the uh, architects, this is uh, all, the, all the facet manufacturer uh, to discuss before all the problem with uh, fixing, cabling, junction box positioning and so on, which often it's forgotten. You come at the end and you have to change something and then it's really difficult because you prepare the glass and then you have problems with the cabling. And yes, this is the idea we are in Switzerland. This is our uh, production site you know, and now we are, I hope, as fast as possible we want to do our own facet with the K of chromatics to uh, showcase. This is now a rendering, but I think it's um, very nice when we have finished this. Okay, this only some examples. Thank you, Thomas, for the presentation. Other questions in the audience? For Thomas. There are no questions online. Oh, ah, okay, sorry. <coughs> um, but I don't know if maybe it was. Ah, yeah. Laura. Yeah, sorry, Laura, but uh, I think you have to write the, the questions in the Q and Q and A menu because uh, it's not possible to uh, to give you the right the right to talk in these team sessions. Well, I think Akira has one question, so please, Akira. Uh, you mentioned the energy loss between uh, six to how about the price of the color module? Does it depend on color? No, the price of the module is always the same for the color. It's a per square meter. But it's not depending on the color. So depending on the output power. Also. Yes. Usually the bronze and so on, you lose a little bit more than the blue and bluish green. I'm waiting if uh, Laura.
Laura wants to write something. Because I think otherwise we will go for the coffee break. Yeah, okay. Well, all right, in case you want to ask something, uh, just, uh, ah, no, okay. Her hand has disappeared, okay. So, uh, well, now we have a coffee break here outside. Uh, well, thank you again, Thomas. <laughs> So, uh, for the people online, we will come back in 15 minutes. Well, our next speaker is Teodosio del Caño uh, from Onyx Solar. Onyx is a company which is located in, in Avila, and actually, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are located here in Spain, but uh, they are, I would say, one of the main companies uh, in the world related with uh, photovoltaic glass. So, yeah, it's an honor to have you here, Teodosio. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Danny. Danny is a very smart guy. He's from my hometown. He's from Valladolid. And he's a physicist, so he's almost a perfect guy. Besides, he works here in Technaria. This means that he's very smart. Um, I am really pleased to be here today because I see so many friends, and especially because for me, Technaria is one of the most outstanding R&D centers, not only in this country, not only in Spain, not only in Europe, but most probably uh, in the world. Technaria is the typical example of how uh, generation of knowledge should take place and how this uh, generation of knowledge shall be transferred into the industry. This is why they succeed in most of the projects that they start. So I am very pleased to be here. Uh, I am very pleased to be here to discuss a little bit about the about DIPD. Uh, we have been very lucky this morning because we have seen three, four really outstanding presentations. And now we are going to talk a little bit about this experience, what we do, where we are, what projects, some of the projects that we have faced, and the new trends in, in APV technology. R&D projects and certifications and applications in being involved, right? So this is a picture of this is a picture of our factory on the right side. And what is photovoltaic glass? What is VIPV? This is very essential and this is very important that we mention it. First of all, we should not confuse building a rapid photovoltaics with building integrated photovoltaics. Building integrated photovoltaic mandatorily. It is mandatory that it is a building materials. This means that we have to consider as an architectural glass in everything that has to do with the standards. And this means that we have we shall meet uh, laminated safety glass in buildings regulations, not only in Europe but also in the States, for instance, or in Australia. This is mandatory. This is a construction material. It is not something that you put over a roof and God knows what happened. No, no. Building integrated materials is a construction material, and this is something that we should assume. Not only the client, not only the manufacturer, also the architects. All the stakeholders should keep this in mind, because then, if not, it's a total mess, messy market. And this is why we are very limited number of players. This is why worldwide you only have five, six good BPV companies, because there are only five, six companies worldwide that do exactly this, doing building materials that have the capability of generating energy by means of photovoltaics. Okay? Very important. We have a building material that is a photovoltaic material. At the same time, it is mandatory that it's a business case for the final product. So any VIPV solution should meet the three Bs that we say in Spanish. Bueno, bonito, barato. This is bueno in the terms of being robust, emitting the building standards, emitting the photovoltaic standards. It must be 
beautiful, bonito, aesthetically value. So when you integrate it, it looks nice in the building. This is something that usually building integrated photovoltaics needs, and this is the lack of something that building adaptive photovoltaics usually do not meet. And then it should be barato. Barato means cheap in Spanish, but don't confuse with cheap. This means building a business case for the final client. And this is very important. Wherever investment we do in a building, from the concept of building integrated materials, we are going to have an additional investment that is the net investment between the typical cost of our building materials and the over cost of the VIPD, and the difference should provide a return of investment that is attractive for the final client. A return of investment that is attractive for the final client can be in a building five, six years. So if you meet a return of investment of the net investment of just six, five years, be sure that the client is going to be happy. So this is our factory in Spain. Uh, we are in Avila, which is really close to Madrid. This is uh, 100 kilometers north from Madrid. It's a small town. It's a world heritage city. This means that it's a beautiful city. You are more than welcome to come and visit. Uh, right now, we have a, a production capability of, let's say, that uh, depending on the type of glass, we can be between 120,000 square meters per year up to 150,000 square uh, meters per year up in optimal production. Um, we have carried out over 350 projects worldwide. When we mean worldwide, we really mean world. worldwide. We have been doing projects in Bangladesh, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Australia, uh, Worldwide, Mexico, and especially the States. Please keep in mind that 50% of our turnover is coming from the States, mainly Canada, uh, US, and Mexico. Well, we usually work with two different technologies. From one side, on the left side, we have amorphous silicon technology, thin film technology. And on the right side, we have a typical crystalline technology. So we work with two different technologies. Actually, per today, 20% of our production is amorphous silicon, 80% is crystalline. As we pointed out, we have to keep in mind that what we are doing is a building material, it's a laminated safety glass. We all know what is laminated safety glass. It's just a glass, usually thermally treated as tempered glass, heat socket uh, uh, tempered glass or heat strength uh, glass. And what we do is to place the cells between the two uh, glass leaders using different levels of encapsulants. The encapsulants can be ADA, can be PVP, or in certain cases, ionomeric materials. We can, sorry, we can do any type of finish. We can just do plain double laminated glass for fascias. We can do isolated glass units uh, for skylights and curtain walls. So at the end, same, all the different glass types that you find in architectural glass can be done as VIPV glass. Amorphous silicon material, well, aesthetically, it shows an added value because it shows a continuous view. Uh, the main limitation that we have uh, is the fact that the performance is one third of crystalline. In the case of crystalline technology, what we have is that we can freely select different type of shapes. The power output, as I said, it could be easily 17%. And um, it does not show, in principle, the same aesthetic value, but uh, you can get really outstanding things as we see here on the on the right side. So at the end, whenever we are prescribing a project doing the IPV, you have to find a compromise between what the client is looking for or what the architect is looking for. In some cases, you are going to select a morpho silicon material if, for instance, you need a continuous view in a skylight in a retrofitting project. Other times, especially with the last advances that we have had in crystalline technology, crystalline technology can be perfectly uh, integrated in the building as a curtain wall of a skylight or obviously as a fashion. So at the end, it's a question of compromise what the client is looking for. The funny thing is that we keep talking about the standardization, modular construction, whatever in BIPV. And from our experience, sorry to tell you, this is impossible. We have carried out already 400 projects worldwide. Uh, we have something like 400 standard products. And I think that we have done in total within these 400, 20 projects doing a standard product. I mean, so these things of doing something modular 
and mass production never happens. At the end, every client wants his project, wants his specifications, and wants his final customized product. And this is our experience. I don't know what others do, but we, as players in this sector, always get adapted to the client needs, and the client needs is looking for customization, as a matter of fact. So the finishing can be very rich. We can do almost everything. You can do free patterns on the rear. You can provide color. You can use matte finish. We can produce up to four per two meters. Actually, this is the maximum uh, dimension we can do. But think about it. Just with 10 glasses, you can cover a surface of 80 square meters. And we have developed here a wide range of colors, actually. Uh, um, Carl from Viriden mentioned that uh, at the beginning they have tried to get a given color and a given run for a project, and many providers say that they could not build it up. And there is a reason. When you start to deal with colors, not all colors are feasible. From our experience, after trying something like 240 different colors, we have uh, selected a charge of 17 colors, including blue, green, white, uh, marble brownish colors, but these 17 colors. Why? Because when you develop a color, you don't have only to think on the on the visual aspect or optical properties, but also in how the material is going to, how the photovoltaic material is going to harvest the energy. So if you don't have a perfect match between both, between quantum efficiency of the glass, of the cell, plus the optical properties of the, of the color glass, uh, and there is a mismatch, this is not going to work. And you find some, th some funny things. You can see a very transparent glass that believe that you believe that is going to provide you a good performance. And what you see is a drop of 80% in performance uh, uh, from a regular uh, PV glass. And on the other way around, you see a really green color where all the elements, PV cell is fully high and you believe it's going to have a, a low performance and you see that the performance is 120 watts per square meter. So developing colors is not just going and say, please do that right. If you go this approach, usually you don't work. You have to work on the other way around. We have this wide range of colors, please select one that gets as close as possible as your needs. Go to the factory, select, check and play around. Okay, so these are a typical examples. These are full a gray color for a fin, for a facade. This is uh, a blue color that we have developed. And right now, what we are going to see is what we were pointing out. On the left side, we see a typical uh, photovoltaic adva uh, adapted uh, PV compared to a project that we have done in Turkey, that is a ventilated facade, which is fully integrated. Okay? You can see also down a twin city in Bratislava. This is another project that we do. It's a perfect one, fully integrated, adapted to integrated. Here, same thing. On the left side, you see a typical building adapted photovoltaics compared with a PV floor fully workable. The difference here is that I am occupying an active surface of the building. The solution here, as you can see, when it's fully integrated, I can generate energy, but at the same time, I can use the surface. The difference is huge because I am providing multifunctionality. Here we are going to go through some projects. For instance, this project is the Convention Center in Edmonton, Canada. And from the inside, it's beautiful. We have here unique glasses on the left side, and it's fully integrated. And right in the middle, what we have is a braille poem, which is beautiful because you can read it from the outside, and it's a poem about the city of Edmonton. This is a full retrofitting of the uh, uh, port building in Malaga, and this can be fully integrated in a very positive manner. This is how it looks uh, right now. If you can see this is a historical building where if you integrate photovoltaics. Yes, I just got the answer that people like that. I'm just seeing the first slide. Yeah. So, I mean, at least here in, in this screen, uh, I saw the, the same as, as in the big one. So let's try again. I have loaded. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, a project in Malaga. This is a full retrofitting using crystalline technology. This is how it looks <laughs> from the inner side. This is uh, a project in Linares. This is also a historical building after the integration. This is a big touch. It's pretty nice looking. 
Uh, this is a project here in Bilbao. This was the alternative to the project that you visited yesterday. This is the underground uh, station, is Kukuyaga. This is also done in collaboration with Usama. And this is a foster partner project that you can see in Bilbao. This Bilbao underground station, you can go there and go there. And trust me, this is a glass of 3.5 meters per 1.5. It's a fully uh, rich shaped glass, trapezoidal glass with a great color on the rear. It's pretty big. Uh, Rebecca, you are going to be lucky because you will see some rejections on Friday. So the glass is, is pretty big anyway. Uh, this is the Georgia project uh, uh, in Milano. Guys, some of you were last week in Milano visiting around some demos and you have the chance to see this project. Right now, this is one of the second most sustainable uh, office building in in the world, it has been selected within the meeting conference. And if you see all over the main uh, facade of the building, it is fully integrated with VIP units. We developed 2,369 units for this project, so it's a really large scale. And this is how a good VIP uh, building can look like. So office building, typical office building, uh, you can integrate it in such an outstanding manner. Uh, this is a typical application of social housing. Well, 90% of the market is going to be office building, uh, is going to be industrial buildings, commercial buildings, but there is also room for multinational buildings. And this is the typical case of PVC projects. We carry out uh, this project within the PVC uh, frame, and this project is a social housing. This is the Stirling Bank project in Nigeria. It's a full facade integrated with photovoltaics. I wanted to show this project because this shows you that there is no limitation in VIPV. Good clients are worldwide. This is still in Bank in Nigeria. This is the downtown Lagos. A project like this, you can find them worldwide. So this is really important. We should not do only VIPV in Europe and, and the state, major markets. There is an open possibility worldwide. And this is the typical example. Good clients in countries like Nigeria. We are facing our second or third project right now in Nigeria. Oh, this is Valenciaga story, Miami. If you go to Valenciaga, we have done this curtain wall, sorry, with a VIPB. The blue, the glass is blue, and the projection of the of the light within the building is, is blue. This is a project in Canary Islands, this is a project in Barbasto, this is a white fashion building that we have carried out in Israel. This is a fully high end PV. What we see on the left side is fully PV glass. And as you can tell, and actually Thomas said before from grammatics. You have to tell the guy that this is VIPV, otherwise no one will never notice. This is fully high in sense. Uh, this is a project in UK. This is a McDonald's store in Disney World. This is wonderful because this is the outdoors and you cannot uh, understand, and you cannot uh, have the sense of how uh, good weather you have in the outdoors due to this type of integration. The, you can do not see it, but the glass, rare glass is gray and it does prevent the fast the light pass through of heat, especially, so you feel really comfortable. And this is the Disney World uh, in Orlando, so next time you go there, and if you have a chance to go with your kids, please visit it. Uh, this is a project, a small project in Portugal. This is a project in Benghazi University, and this glass is 2 per 2, 8 plus 8, typically uh, Arabic sense integration. This is a, a, a small project in Conil, Town Hall. Oh, this is the Apple Store, and this is typical example of photovoltaic floor. Why? Because this is a fully integrated PV floor on the top of the Union uh, Square shop in Apple. The good thing is that we don't see it here, but they have here a green wall. I think what you see it here. So this, they can use this as an open space, whatever they want. So the good thing is that, uh, sorry, the good thing is that they can do a multifunctional use of the top of the, of the building. This is anti-slip treatment. You can walk over there, you can do parties, whatever. In the day, you can generate energy. In the night, you can party on top, have nothing. This is the glass. The glass is huge. This is the result. This is the green uh, facade. This is the top. This is the store. So you have a stairs. You can go up. You just put a, a fence over and you can party on top. And this on the right side, the glass. Okay. Please check the glass. The glass is four meters long. 
This is right now some place in Amorphos. This is the George Washington University done with a scan scan designed by Berkey Wills, typical Finns applications. Uh, this is the Bellworks a retrofitting project in the States. This was very important because this project forced us to preserve landmark. This building was done in 1958, important for you, Daniel and I. Two Nobel Prize awarded in physics, working in this lab, lab, uh, Bell Labs. And the first terrestrial uh, PV cell developed in 1958 was done in this lab. So as a physicist, for me, it was an honor to carry out this uh, retrofitting process. We have here 6,000 pieces of PV glass. And trust me if I tell you that the building after the retrofitting looks exactly the same as before. And this is the main objective of doing retrofitting building with a portable silicon, preserving the, the, the way it looks. Uh, this integration in a, this is a very well-known building in Madrid, close to Madrid, ING Bank building. Whenever you go on the highway, you see the building. And this is a skylight that we carry out. Oh, this is one of the most outstanding retrofitting that we have done. This is in Essen, in Belgium, and it has been done with a top uh, glacier. This uh, Forselmans is pretty big in, in the Flemish area, and this was a custom uh, building, and it was totally abandoned, and they have fully retrofitted using our class. This is the Twin City uh, project in Bratislava. We work again with Skanska. We have worked four or five times with Skanska two times in, in Europe, three times in the States. Uh, how important is to work, work with big general contractors? Onyx, his first project was with Turner in the States, Novartis building. Once you are able to do a good project in the States with a good general contractor, it opens the market for you forever. This was our case. We have another project here. This is the full retrofitting of Fensa Coca-Cola building in Mexico. Uh, this is a, a really finished project right now using color PV. Again, it's fully hidden PV. You cannot see the cells. And we finished this project in Barcelona in the Escocesa area. This is the new building, the new uh, area close to Diagonal that is going to be promoted in Barcelona. It's a Meridiana uh, neighborhood. And there we have already carried out four works in the last two years, and we are starting the fifth. So right now, if you go, Barcelona is becoming one of the main hot spots of VIPB in Spain. Oh, this is R&D Center in Vigua. This is the Vigua project. We did 500 pieces of glass, 218 of them totally unique, and, and we integrated there. This is Samsung uh, Tanyon Payar building. Uh, this is a balustrade, Fabio, but using in amorphous silicon material. Uh, and it's integrated in Shanghai, in China. It's tough to sell glass to the Chinese guys. We did it, but it's very tough. Glass. Uh, this is a, a PV floor done in, in Manhattan, in a private housing. It's really beautiful. All that we have seen makes no sense if you are not a company of doing R&D projects. If you don't uh, count with us as in Sulci or Penalia, you are wasting your time. Your company must be built up upon the generation of knowledge in three ways. Basic science, R&D development projects, and fast track projects. You cannot put a product without testing in the market because you kill the market. You cannot lie a client saying that your performance is going to be very big, and then you say, no, sorry, it was not 195 watts per square meters. That was a theoretical value. No, this is bullshit. You cannot bullshit the final client because you kill the reputation, not only your reputation, but everyone in the sector reputation. So anything that you put in the market must be tested in a robust manner through R&D. So you have to be very rich in R&D. And this is something that is mandatory in us. We have five guys only doing R&D. We have collaborations only doing R&D. And everything we develop is based in doing R&D. And these are examples of the projects that we have done. Color PV, fascias, life cycling products, demo, uh, PV sites. So this is nine out of the 27 that we have carried out. 27 European projects in 13 years. As a small medium enterprise, it's pretty large. And I think it's very important. Give the chance to generation of knowledge. Without generation of knowledge, uh, technological companies make no sense. This is really important.
Thank you. This is the certifications area. Well, it's very easy. IAC, mandatory, standardization as uh, safety glass in buildings, mandatory. Thank you very much for your time. And, uh, I am back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Teodosio, for the interesting talk. So, in so many interesting projects, yeah. Well, time for questions. The audience, other questions? Teodosio. Otherwise, I will check also the. A little bit. Maybe there are some questions. Ah, yeah. Astrid, <coughs> is a skin. Yeah. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, Rebecca, go ahead. Yeah, sorry for the presentation. Um, so, a very quick question is that on the floor, it's very, very interesting for you doing products globally. And can you tell us your secrets about your business model? Why do you think you are so successful? Is that because you have different actions from the building sector? Or I oh. had your architects yesterday, I had a great case with him, I, I say, some differences from your business model um, with other, some other companies, I say, yeah, I think. Uh, very good question, very smart question, Rebecca. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, companies is not a question of money, it's not a question of equipment. We open our, our factory to everyone that want to visit. We are going to be there Friday because you cannot copy us. Why? Because the secret is in people. Companies do a huge amount of investment in equipment that go nowhere, but they treat like sheep people. So the secret is treating people in the way they deserve. Make them part of the company. And this is one of the main secrets. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you do not, because dealing with people is not always easy. People is very difficult to deal, to deal with them, but people need to be happy and believe in your project. This is the first point. I mean, you can come from a uh, MENA region, you can come from Saudi Arabia saying that I want to put 50 million euros, please do this factory in Yemen. This will never happen. It's impossible because people is key. So focus on people. Once you have focus on people, you need multidisciplinary things. You cannot be in the VATV sector without counting on architects. In Onyx, we have 50 guys. And I believe we have six, seven architects. We have five, six guys on R&D, and we have seven, eight uh, uh, engineers. This is obvious. And then within the, the factory, we have 28 guys, all of them uh, with knowledge of material science, with knowledge of production process, whatever. So multidisciplinary team are key. This is a technical sale, meaning that all the guys that deal with client need a good commercial capabilities and technical capabilities. This is mandatory. And this is how I see it. Besides that, you have to be lucky. You have always to tell the truth to the client. Many companies that do not succeed is because they succeed in one project but not in the second because they are not honest with the final client. This happens a lot. The client then will never repeat or never give good reference. Um, and then marketing policy. We have a really excellent team on the market that make our company uh, very uh, visual worldwide. And this is also very important. I hope I have the project. Just make sure. Yeah. Are there more questions in the audience? Yeah, Akira, go ahead. Uh, do you have, I'm thinking I'm more of a second and also a uh, How do you use the proposed uh, that the you say it's the same for, for some type of equipment. Yeah. Yes, uh, at the end of what the client, you, this is an uh, option that you give to the client. The client is going to take a decision over a compromise between aesthetic value, where are you going to integrate the solution, uh, what is going to be the cost, and from there he takes the decision. And the need of performance. Right now, out of 10 of our projects are crystalline, 24% are amorphous silicon. It is also true that those that are amorphous silicon usually are very outstanding. For example, right now we are starting the NL headquarters in Rome with Permastelisa, and it's going to be uh, amorphous silicon. 
We have just finished a Phoenix House in Birmingham, in UK, with Richard Ellis as a building owner, uh, and a real estate uh, company, and, and it's also amorphous. So at the end, it's a question of what the clients decide on. Well, we have two additional questions in the online. So, how did you achieve uh, fire safety tests or certificates for the high-rise buildings? As uh, Astrid, yeah. By testing, is <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I do understand the question because, um, in a general manner, and this Xavier is going to Xavier Olano that is going to give us the last talk here. He's the fire expert. But from our experience, uh, for glass, uh, it is reasonable to get a BS1, B0 uh, classification, but the N13501. Uh, this can be achieved uh, with a glass glass uh, lamination process. Uh, this is a, a pretty good fire classification, but if you are looking for classification as A1, A2, uh, it's not that easy because there is the system as a whole becomes critical. This means that this is an effort not only from the glass manufacturer, but also from the framing provider in such a way that they need to develop a system as a whole in order to achieve A1, A2 classification. Actually, for instance, it's a pity that we don't have our Italian friends here, but without, within the IPV booth, uh, we have done a demo with our Italian farmers where the glass has achieved a A1, a two uh, fire uh, classification. So at the end, it's a question of testing. Testing the glass is be sure that if you build your glass in a good condition, it's going to be BS1, B0, because the glass always per UL790 is going to be classified as a class A material. So you have a good fire system material, you take it into a build, uh, into a framing system that is going to allow you to get BS1, B0, a chimney is not a question only the glass, it's the system as a whole in my understanding. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, two more questions that I think are interesting, but uh, I will ask you for a short answer because otherwise oh, sure, we'll, sure. we'll have too much time. But, but I think I think they are interesting. So, uh, Pierluigi asked uh, for three priority aspects for Onyx to create a solid VIP market by 2030. At least. <laughs> <laughs> not easy. No. Not easy. Very easy. <laughs> um, okay, very, I think it's only one. In order to create a solid VIPV market, we need new players. Right now, it's not a question of competence. We are not competitors. We are partners in developing this market. If new players do not appear, it is impossible that the actual players can absorb the, the, the market demand. This means that glass industry should come into the VIPV sector by putting money, allowing us to grow. Because right now the VIPV market, we are still too small. We are just five, six companies and we have a production capability and the demand is much higher than us. If we see the trends for 2030, it's crazy. We are companies all together that may absorb a market of 100 million euros. What is going to happen with the other 900, 1000 million that are there? So it's not three aspects, it's just one. Open companies, bringing new players to the market, founding to make us bigger. Plus industrial partners or equity, God knows. This I think is critical because the other aspects are done. Uh, this is a robust product that can be integrated anywhere. Okay. And well, the last one, uh, Erica from Subsea asks, uh, how is it uh, BIM? Uh, I mean, it is all, are you already working with uh, with BIM or how is it, uh, is, do you see an increase in, in the BIM use? Uh, of course, uh, BIM is becoming a, a key analytical tool and a, a key tool in architectural design. What I am more skeptic, and this is public and everyone knows, is that I do not believe that just pressing a button, you can get a BIM drawings, you put it on your line and woo, 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 and you have the final product done with BIM. I am really skeptic about that. I believe BIM is an excellent tool for design, but I think that to integrate it in a 
In an online process in BAPB, per today is impossible because right now, as I said, BAPB is based on a very fully customized solutions, which are difficult to integrate in, in production as a PIM element. Okay. Well, thank you, Teodosio. No, no, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. So uh, now we move to to the next speaker, who is uh, Jose Mari Vega de Seoane. He's a colleague here from Tecnalia. He's expert. He's a senior researcher in in BIPB from the solar department. He has coordinated. Uh, well, now it's going to be the, the second European project that we are going to start. So, well, go ahead. Hey, thanks, thanks, Danny. And well, it's always difficult to talk at the Teodosio Canyon because I mean. This presentation is always overwhelming with so many interesting ex uh, examples of BIPV, but well, we, we have a little contribution to, to the topic. Uh, so I will present uh, the outcome of PV site project, uh, one of the demo sites of, of the project work was done in, in this building, and we will tell a little bit how was this process and what was the experience we got from this uh, project. The demo site description, uh, so the ones you, you were in San Sebastian these couple of days, you, you had the, the opportunity to visit uh, the facade. It is, uh, well, the south facing uh, curtain wall uh, in this building. So we have three curtain walls and we used two of them to uh, well, prepare and, and develop our, our new uh, BAPV system. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, sorry, sorry. I was trying to uh, show the the presentation in. Yeah, no, it's okay. okay. So we the intervention areas are, are the two curtain walls you, you can see on the bottom right part. Uh, in total, 164 uh, square meters. Uh, this is the aspect of the curtain wall before the, the um, refurbishment and also the, for the, the view from the inside. Um, well, you can see that it's sort of a complex shape, so it's not curved but uh, polygon face, and it was one of the challenges we had to, to face in the development phase. Uh, then, focusing on the process, uh, so basically we had like six, six different steps, starting from uh, definition of specifications, then moving to conceptual uh, detail design and prototyping, uh, testing, as Theo was mentioning, important part, uh, permitting process, uh, prototype manufacturing, and, and then installation and commissioning. So on the specification side, we have mainly four key aspects that, that we needed to, to solve in the, in the design, uh, well, preserving the aesthetics, uh, or improving them in, to the possible extent. And then ensuring reliability and safety of, of the solution, since it's a um, European project, but the, the ambition was to really keep the, the installation um, alive as long as possible. Uh, but also improving to the possible extent the interior comfort, and then uh, well, easing the, the operation and maintenance of the, of the installation. So starting with the architectural uh, conceptual design, we we had two main uh, ideas that were developed in the project uh, by Terk, our colleague uh, from from Bear ID. Uh, so the first one was copying uh, the existing curtain wall on the outside layer. So really uh, developing um, an outer surface that uh, copied the, the existing curtain wall um, structure. This was assessed at, at conceptual phase, but finally discarded due to the cost 
uh, that this solution uh, had. And the second idea was uh, using only vertical profiles. Uh, so this was finally the, the concept that evolved further and, and we finally uh, decided to, to use, to implement. So um, once we entered in the, in the detail design, uh, well, we, we easily saw that we really needed to double the vertical profile, so we, we couldn't share the, the vertical profile between modules uh, due to this polygon phase uh, that the complex facade uh, has, and we, we had to double the, the vertical profile. And we, we also had to include a central uh, profile, even if we didn't, we, we wanted to avoid this due to the uh, well, uh, disturbance that this vertical profile uh, provided in, from the inside. But uh, it, it, this was a mechanical constraint uh, after the mechanical analysis that uh, Hilti made. And then uh, using uh, clip fixing elements, uh, the ones you can see in, in the screen on the left side, the ones we are using, we were using in the top and bottom parts of the installation and, and the intermediate uh, clips. And then some kind of complex uh, little pieces like this one, this plastic uh, PPDM um, piece that w uh, was needed to uh, avoid the contact between the glass and, and the metal parts. And this was one of the more difficulties we faced uh, during the, ins the installation phase. I will later on uh, explain why. And well, this, this was the final um, aspect of the of the of the BIPV system after the detailed design was completed. Uh, one could, could challenge if this is BIPV or BAPV. In our opinion, there's no doubt because uh, well, uh, this was there was a customized uh, design that wanted to or was seeking to preserve the, the aesthetics and even improve them. Uh, we also were considering this as a building component, not as a standard module. So I think even if there was no replacement of the curtain wall and it's an added to the system facade, this is a real BAPV case. Uh, on the module side, we well, the final design was one you can see on, on the right side. Uh, we were using uh, six six plus six uh, module using uh, black contact solar cells. Uh, two module dimensions, since there were slight differences between uh, one curtain wall and, and the second one. Uh, but yeah, in approximately 2 meters 25 by uh, 0.76 meters, a 40% transparency degree, um, 32 kilogram per square meter, and a peak power of uh, 191 uh, per peak. So, uh, module efficiency around 11-12%. Uh, and then at system level, we were uh, finally having 18 um, kilowatt peak power. We used four inverters, uh, two per facade, and the estimation uh, generation was like uh, 12,000 kilowatt hour per year, and as 100% self-consumption mode. Um, we can see here the first prototype, uh, not the final prototype that we implemented in demo, but a, a concept that uh, was based on, on the final uh, design, and also a mock-up uh, of the um, uh, profile and, and construction solution, also including this uh, fitting piece that uh, was uh, needed to uh, ensure what what water tightness in, after the intervention on in the in the slabs. So this was very useful to really discuss with local uh, companies in charge of the installation. Uh, then on testing, uh, we uh, proceeded to, to really um, perform a, um, an extensive testing campaign uh, following the existing standard and at the moment EN uh, 50583. So we had on the one side PV testing related activities and on the other side uh, construction related testing uh, following attack 34, now uh, updated to this EAD. And we performed uh, soft uh, hard body impact uh, window test, uh, fire reaction tests, and, and also mechanical tests on, on the um, on the slab in order to uh, well somehow uh, confirm that the assumptions that he made in the calculations were indeed correct. We have um, a story to tell on this aspect, but I, I will leave this for for the end. Just uh, one second. 
you can notice where they are performing this uh, this mechanical test, and, and I will tell you then what happened when we started with the installation. So, on the permitting manufacturing installation process, uh, we have uh, in principle two main um, um, permitting process that, that were going in, in parallel the construction works uh, license uh, request and the access and connection request for the self consumption installation. So, uh, both of them took around three to four months of uh, time. So, so, it's something you need to, to plan in advance and also take into account that there can be amendments uh, that could delay this further. So, we needed a project visa from a local architect and the approval from the council that we got. Uh, we needed also to appoint a project manager for the supervision of the construction works and also for the safety coordination. And then we, we asked uh, for a connection point inside the building uh, in order to, to allow, allow us a self-consumption installation. So, to legally uh, well, present this installation. Uh, well, this is our, one of the first prototypes that Onyx manufactured uh, in their factory. Um, so, at that time, uh, there was no um, uh, automatic soldering or tabber stringer for, for the crystals, uh, the back contact solar cells. So, they had really to manually solder each, each one of them. So, in total, uh, 384 strings and more than 6,000 6, uh, solar cells were soldered. Uh, by hand, by Yoni, so it was really a massive effort and, and without taking into consideration the rejections that certainly they, they had to face. So, really tough, tough uh, manufacturing phase for them. 96 models, 48 per, per facade. Now we have evolved and uh, in the second European project we have developed a, a semi automatic uh, um, soldering tower stringer. You are happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, we have a picture here of the, one of the gratings that uh, Onyx sent to, to us in order to start with the, the installation phase. And the, well, the tools that the local installers use to, to handle the, the heavy and, and big uh, modules. So, uh, the installation and commissioning, we started with the preparation of the uh, structure. So first, uh, they removed the metal plates. Uh, here on the left side, you can see how they, they rem removed part of the metal plates in order to insert uh, all the, the fitting pieces and, and ensure the water tightness of the installation since we needed to screw the, the um, uh, slabs. And then, well, it took like uh, five days to, to to install the, the vertical profiles in total in, in both facades. And uh, for the module installation, uh, we we had two brave and strong uh, uh, people from Bicote Solar, a local company, a local installer, and they they performed this uh, starting quite slowly the first day, but they after they they uh, well started to to get familiarized with the handling and and so on. Uh, they, they moved much faster and, and in, in total it took like four days for the completion of the both uh, curtain walls. This is one of the images uh, of the sunrise before starting the second day of the installation. And the final uh, well, uh, overview of the, of the installation on, this, on the second day. Uh, in the bottom part, we have the electrical layout. We used uh, four inverters in total, two per facade, uh, and three strings were connected to each, each of them. This is a before and after. Uh, so, as you can see, we also improved the, the weather. Um, the before and after the, the inside uh, view. The, the final result of, of the installation. Then I will finalize with a uh, final conclusion or lesson learned uh, slide uh, based on our experience in the project. Uh, so we faced um, what, what we found is that there was no local uh, player being able to solve both construction and PV installations uh, at the same time. So we really had to contact them separately. 
and, and make them work together. Uh, so uh, the clear conclusion here is that we need to reskill the construction sector with BB, BIP related uh, know-how and capacities. Um, the importance of, of prototyping phase um, and really building prototypes and mockups to um, enrich the discussion between uh, local installers because they didn't have any experience at all in, in BIPB. And then unexpected issues um, which arrive and sometimes you can be prepared and, and sometimes not. Uh, so we, one of the issues we had was, was the um, clip that I mentioned before. So this clip was using um, 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 plastic uh, part that was intended to avoid the, the contact between the, um, the glass and the metal. But this, this piece wasn't fixed to the clip, so if you didn't fix it, it was impossible really to mount the modules. You, you can imagine a module like 225, 55 uh, kilograms, it's impossible to really place that uh, without moving this, this clip. So we really had to finally glue this in each uh, clip. So it was a really um, hard preparatory work in advance. And uh, so these are things that you need to, to keep in mind in, in advance and before selecting the, the clip solution that would have avoid us uh, a lot of work. And then spare modules also are needed because uh, sometimes, uh, well, accidents occur and, and, and in, in, in our case, we, we had one breakage and we had like the corner module that was finally not installed after uh, two, three months later that we, we finally managed to the, the final spare module. And then as a, as a continuation of the, of the um, story I was telling on, on, the, on the mechanical test that he did perform. So from the bottom side, in order to avoid really removing the metal plate, but the day of the installation when they actually started to drill, they saw that the concrete of the slab was not uh, the expected one. So there was a mixed concrete and therefore the, the test that they had done was not long, longer valid. And they remade the calculations and the anchoring system that they had, they, they had um, selected was no longer um, valid. So they had to change uh, to an, a chemical anchoring system and we made all the calculations. So I, I saw the first day of, of the installation, the field is commercial guy sweating, uh, like improvising and, and having a hard moment because this was something unexpected. The drawings didn't mention that there was a mixed uh, concrete slab and this was a surprise they, they had to face and, and solve in the moment. But it, it was done very efficiently, but uh, he had a, a really hard time, I, I guess. So that's, uh, that's all from my side. So thanks. Oh, well, I, of course, the acknowledgement to, to the project partners, the sites and Bicote and Bikine who were in charge of the installation. And then I have a video. It's one, one minute video with the time lapse installation.
Thank you, Gemma, for the presentation. Are there questions? Well, let's start with Akira, I don't think. The service of the APPS is now not much flat. Not flat, calling the page. I am interested in why you chose that service for people. Yeah, it's some kind of discussion among the panel that it depends on the time. So it's in different control. Yeah, there's there's a mismatch in the energy. We, we try to solve this by uh, mixing somehow the, the streams um, that look in the inverter. So we, we chose one on the bottom side, another stream in the top side, another one in the bottom side, and the same in the other direction with, with the second uh, inverter, in order to somehow um, compensate this mismatch in the orientation of the, of the facet facade. There to choose that service for research. I'm sorry. Yeah. The reason why you chose you chose that service is not uh, not research. That we wanted to to address this use case in this case, not not for research purpose. Uh, I we did, this was not the, the, the final goal. Okay. Also to, to improve the shading in the. Uh, curtain wall because uh, it was quite hot in the inside and, and we wanted to shade a little bit and this was well, feasible with, with this implementation. I think there was another question. Yeah. Okay. No, it, it was a general photovoltaic uh, uh, permitting process. So there was nothing specific on the photovoltaic side. No additional uh, problems no. regarding the, the type of the panel. No, nothing. No, we, we only had to show that it was a construction material that met some uh, specifications in terms of fire reaction, for example. But this was part of the construction. Yeah, the, 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 the permits. Yeah. Permit. Yes, no. no. Installation, yes, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't perform the construction part, so yeah. we we had to to have two partners instead of one. Yes. Okay, thank you, Chema. So, well, now we have uh, another coffee break. Uh, we are a little bit uh, delay, but uh, well, let's try to at least uh, be. 10 minutes outside in order to go to the toilet, take a coffee or whatever, and then we come back. Okay, we have to start again. We have now the talk from Nuria Martin Chivelet. She's a senior researcher at uh, CMAT. She has been working in BIPV for, for many years. Please, people. <laughs> we have to start. Please. I think the people who want to continue with the networking. They, they, yeah, it has, not, it, has, it has not been enough with the time of the coffee break. Right? <laughs> we have to start with Nuria. Um, she has worked for many years in, in BIPV. And, well, in the context that I explained before, in this uh, group of uh, the International Energy Agency, there at CMAT, they have performed, uh, well, they have analyzed how it is the BIPV in Spain. So the, the market, the players, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and now she's going to explain us a little bit about uh, well, a summary of, of all these results that they have seen. How is BIPV in Spain? Go ahead, Maria. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, good morning and hello to everyone that is connected online. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me to this workshop. This presentation is going to be a bit different from the former. And well, the thing is that uh, uh, I'm going to 
to resume, to summarize the, the main outcomes of our collaborative work we have performed under subtask A in task 15 during this last year and a half and is related to the uh, technological in innovation system analysis we have performed uh, for the APB in, in Spain. So this stands for technological innovation system which consists of the actors that are involved in a, in a technology, in this case BIPD, the networks that make possible the interactions uh, among these actors, and the uh, context or the framework, which includes not only the um, regulations, standards and so on, but also the, what we call the soft institutions, which means the cultural and the perception, for example, for, uh, for, for the society, from the society to this technology. Well, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Interrupt yes. you because the, the the presentation I think is not being shared. They are people, the people is just seeing the, the video. So. Um, Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, we have analyzed the this structure and this means that we have identified the main current actors that participate in the in the system in the VIPV system. Uh, which are mainly, in the case of Spain, architects, some architects, one globally leading BIPV manufacturer, you already know which is, Sonic Solar, research and technological centers and universities. These are the main, but there are other actors that uh, we have participated also in this search, uh, but not so, so relevant uh, currently. Uh, there are also, of course, national networks such as you know, the uh, well, public and private net networks that uh, make possible the interaction and the development of BIPV. But uh, it's it, uh, honestly, they are not specific for BIPV, but for PV and for renewable energies. And so. Uh, Mm, they, know, they don't focus on BIPV, which is uh, it's important in this uh, analysis, um, and they are mainly supported by Europe. About the soft institutions, uh, we perceive that they are gain, gaining strength, which means uh, the social awareness uh, towards the environmental and energy emergency is increasing, so PV is gaining uh, success. Uh, although there are some some barriers, but I, I will talk about this after. Um, about the hard institutions, um, well, to say that as in the rest of uh, Europe, European countries, there is no uh, BIPV harmonized standards yet, as you know. Uh, and in Spain, there are no not uh, there are no specific regulations towards BIPV. And what is also important is that uh, BIPV is not in the technical building code. It's, this is a pity because some years ago, in 2006, uh, when the first building te uh, technical building code was approved, um, PV was compulsory for new and retrofit buildings of the tertiary sector. Um, PV was uh, compulsory and BIPV was supported against BAPV. So this was a very, very good situation. And this is the reason why uh, tertiary buildings uh, were the main focus at the beginning of BAPV in Spain. And this tendency continued, as you can have seen with the uh, ONIX presentation. Most BAPV examples in Spain are in the tertiary uh, sector, and few of them are uh, in the residential sector. So we uh, the history of BIPV has laid 
uh, to this situation now, which doesn't mean that in the future we will have, a, of course, a big potential for, for residential buildings. Well, after the structural analysis, we have uh, go, um, we have gone to the uh, functions that were shared by Michel Van Noor, uh, who is the, the, um, the leader of this uh, subtask. And uh, what we have done is to review the BIPB Spanish publications, patents and projects all related to BIPB. So it was a uh, hard work. <laughs> Because, well, but at the end, uh, uh, we've seen that there are quite a good quality, good, good production in uh, publications, uh, patents and projects. And we have also uh, conducted uh, interviews directly to uh, relevant um, agents related to BIPB and massive questionnaires that were um, sent to um, the different um, stakeholders, type of stakeholders we have identified. So, as I said, the knowledge development in Spain related, related to BIPB is sufficient uh, or it has sufficient quality, we understand, but it is quite limited to the uh, scientific field. Uh, Oppositely, there is little technology uh, or technological production and market knowledge to, to our understanding of the, the study. Um, but this knowledge is not well disseminated, which we understand is a key action for BIPB to, to develop. There is not, um, and especially not between the photovoltaic and the construction sectors. Architects are demanding more information from manufacturers and suppliers and from the research centers and so on. So this is a uh, pending homework we have in the BIPB community about uh, the entrepreneurial experimentation. We have to say that there is a slow growth from the construction sector. It's slow, but it is it is there. So we are very happy. Um, there is. Of course, one BIPV manufacturing in Spain that stands out. This is important to say, and this is a, a, an important driver uh, of BIPV activity in Spain. And uh, also to say that there are very few pilot, pilot projects, which uh, architects un understand and developers understand it's a very good uh, well, a thing to have uh, for uh, to, be, to have examples of real uh, installations that are continuously monitoring um, to extract information of real projects. <clears throat> this is also lacking. About the resource mobilization, uh, yeah, there are, there, is, there are funds, of course, for PV and for uh, renewable energy, but, but they are not specific to BIPV. And there, is, there are not enough specific qualified technicians. As you have already seen in the previous uh, presentations, there is a lack of skilled people uh, directly expert in VIP. Also, the social capital development uh, says, well, the analysis of, of this function says that uh, the trust and communication between <clears throat> Uh, people is only happens only between known agents. This means that there is not really smooth communication. <coughs> Sorry, in general. Uh, <coughs> another item is the legitimacy of BIPV technology. It has good acceptance and perception from the society. Uh, but there are two main barriers, the cost and the administrative uh, process, which is true, is getting better. Um, about the, well, the orientation of the search uh, is related to the future perception of opportunities. Uh, and we have to say that the general framework 
uh, gives a lot of opportunities to BIPB. Concretely, the self-consumption success, now, by the way, um, it is expected that at the end of this year, uh, we will have about 3.5 gigawatts of self-consumption this year. Last year was about 2 gigawatts. So, it's increasing tremendously. So, this is, of course, a good opportunity for BIPV and also the energy rehabilitation uh, needs. Both of these actions are supported by the government. So, people is um, participating in these kind of, of actions. Uh, so there is opportunity for BIPB, of course, but uh, there is no specific regula regulatory and financial support addressed to BIPB. This is not good. And the majority of products are um, BIPB glazing products. This is not good or bad, but just to say that the market is mainly focusing this kind of, of solution. Um, about the market development, we see that uh, BIPB is still a niche market, but it is a market, although with a good uh, future perspective to our understanding. And uh, the thing is that uh, there is no clear policy support for the industry. So there are things, positive and negative things. At the end, we arrive to these recommendations. Uh, Towards policymakers, uh, we suggest that uh, that it's well, it's important to develop BIPB harmonized standards and regulations, and to include the uh, BIPB in the technical building code. Mm, we understand that this this is a key action because the construction sector uh, follows this uh, technical building code. So, if uh, the IPB appears there as a construction product, as a solution for, together with um, a refurbish, refurbishment or renovation uh, solutions for increasing the efficiency in, in buildings and so on, uh, for sure, uh, the IPB is going to be considered. In fact, there are um, uh, funding for renovation but BIPV products are not considered as eligible, eligible uh, products in this uh, funding. So, this is something to, to change and also to have BIPV specific incentives. Regarding education, we suggest to include BIPV in education and training programs and to increase the specialist, specialized staff. Um, a good action would be to, uh, to use the uh, public uh, buildings as examples, BIPV examples. Um, uh, this is starting, but it, it's going very slowly. And about the industry and the market, we should increase the interaction and relations between, between PV and construction sectors. This is a good example, this workshop, uh, but it's not so useful and, well, in many other forums and yeah, to have the opportunity to exchange perspectives to information and so on. And uh, of course, to include BIPV in retrofit actions. These are our recommendations or the main recommendations is extracted from, from this work. So this finishes here. I, uh, I only wanted to comment about a collaborative new uh, project in which we are working together with the Polytechnic University of Mali. You have seen uh, the co-authors of this report are uh, from uh, this university. And, uh, well, the idea is to, uh, to develop renovation, well, the name is Renovation Innovative Global Solutions with Building Integrated Photovoltaics. It is funded by the Spanish Ministry of Science and innovation and co-financed by the European Regional Development Fund. And well, the participants, uh, we, we coordinate this, this project, it's a coordinated project uh, in which uh, CMR, which is uh, expert in testing, characterization and modeling B, uh, PV and BIPV modules and systems, will also focus on forecasting 
the, 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 well, the monitoring and forecasting the, the production of BIPD systems. And the two departments of the Polytechnic University of Madrid, which are the Construction and Technology in Architecture and the Solar Energy Institute, which have uh, a long experience, uh, a long expertise in, in, in PV systems in general, but also in BIPV, uh, will they focus on the uh, BIPV implementation on a district scale, uh, energy efficiency in buildings um, related issues, and well, PV self-consumption, load management, and also natural solutions like um, veg veg vegetation solutions, natural solutions combined with uh, BIP. Okay, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Yeah, to say that uh, the, the complete uh, report uh, will appear soon in the web page of Task 15, so you will have the opportunity to read it deeply, with uh, especially may be interesting to look at the appendices, which contain the list of publications, the list of patents and, and projects uh, related to BAPB in Spain. And um, yeah, for further information, you can contact me directly. So, any questions or comments? Yeah. <laughs> well, are there questions in the audience? Why is to check here? That was, uh, mm. that was one hour ago. Yeah. No, this is what's related with, yeah, with phonics. So no questions? Well, questions? If you have second thoughts and whatever, <laughs> you can contact my, me directly. Mm. And of course, look at the report, which is the result of a large, um, a, a large uh, investigation of research about this, this yes. the IPV in, in Spain. Yeah, actually, I, I, I can say that uh, I reviewed the report yeah, and yeah. it's quite interesting. You. There you, yeah. can, you can find very interesting, yeah. Yeah, I have to say it. thank you to all that reviewed this, this report, which was very important for us to have the confirmation or the, the correction from experts in, in Spain. And um, well, I, I hope the final, yeah, the, 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 the thing is that and this is a very um, this report is tied to the time when it is developed. Yeah. So the situation, uh, well, the, the date of the of the data and the research is March 22. Hmm. So if we um, make like a second edition, for instance, in two three years, for sure the results are going to change. So hmm. it's like a picture. Of the time. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Maria. you. Thank you, Danny. Well, so we move to the final speaker, Xavier Olano. He's uh, our expert in the house, uh, in everything related with fire in buildings. Uh, he's the manager of the fire lab, uh, normally it's in Arpetia. And well, he's going to explain us how is it, uh, well, I think all of us have doubts regarding fire and the standards that we have to perform and things like that actually. It's a topic that has been already here. Uh, some people have already asked about it. So I think it's a very interesting topic and the, the people uh, will have a lot of doubts. So I hope you solve at least some of them. <laughs> well, go ahead. Okay, so thank you, Danny, for your words. And uh, thank you also for all the people waiting in, uh, here because I am the last of the meeting. So hopefully it is worth the, the, the waiting. So uh, before I start the presentation, I would like to talk about three aspects that uh, I think it's important for you to, to understand. The uh, first one is the, the wording, because I, I feel that uh, sometimes when we talk about fire, there are some uh, specific words that are maybe confused or mixed. And uh, I'm talking about uh, the difference between fire reaction, fire resistance, 
a type propagation. Because it's important to understand that there are three different contents. So uh, when we talk about fire reaction, we are talking about how the material or, or the product behaves in case of fire. If, if, if the material releases heat or a smoke or there are framing droplets. So it's, it's a matter of mainly the material, but the behavior in case of fire. When we talk, when we talk about fire resistance, we are talking about the fire containment. Imagine that there is a fire in a room, so the material or, or the system or the structure around has to contain this fire. So this is a, a different concept. It's not the reaction to fire, it is the fire containment. So I think it's important to understand. And finally, the fire propagation. When we talk about fire propagation, it's an additional one, which is a fire that maybe it's developed here in, in this room and goes out in the, in, in the window and it starts to propagate in, in the facade. So there, there are three different aspects that need to be considered. The second one, it's about the um, fire scenario. When we talk about fire, it's very important to understand which is the fire scenario, what we are trying to simulate and what, what we are trying to, let's say, assess or evaluate or to measure. Because this is also something that sometimes is not very clear. And finally, uh, I think also some of you have already mentioned, but uh, also again, to, I'm repeating, but uh, it's important to understand that we are talking about systems, not just materials, isolated products. We are talking about systems. And we can have a, a mixture of good uh, and good materials, but if the system is not correctly designed, it will fail. So this is also something important to, to understand, that we are not just talking about materials, but also systems. So today, my idea is to talk about all of these, those four aspects. First is the, is the background, about the uh, fire and BIPB. Second one, the current standard and regulations. The third is how, as Technalia, we have worked with BIPB and fire. And finally, the further research of what are we doing right now for the next years. So if we talk about background, there is, there is this document here that probably some of you know, and, or even you have participated in the, in the elaboration, and that gives, gives us like, like nice, nice conclusions. That, and this document was done in, in 2020. And if you see in the, in the first uh, paragraph, it is talking that uh, there are like, like huge fire incidents. And uh, also something that was like shocking for me, that uh, it, it, it is stated that BIPB hazard is 10 times higher than BAPB. So I think this is also something important. So the main conclusion is that fire is something that we need to consider and we need to research. The second one is uh, stating that um, uh, th there is a need for new testing procedures. There is also a need to mo monitor the system during the operation because can, maybe it can give us some, let's say, alerts or warnings because if some parts are uh, overheating or if there is something that uh, seems that it's not regular, can give us some uh, some ideas. And finally, that is not a clear regulatory framework. I think this is something that already has mentioned this morning, but I think it's important to to to, to say it again. And uh, if we continue with this document, there it is stated that uh, in let's say in some building codes in Sweden and and, and Norwegian building codes, uh, they, they are using this CNTS. 1187 method two for uh, the, let's say, the fire spread in, in roofs. And also it is concluded that maybe it is not really good uh, standard or maybe we need to find another one because it's not the representative reality. So it, it is giving us like uh, some tips of maybe, okay, we are using this standard for testing classification, but maybe it's not enough. Also, there is another, uh, the, the second paragraph is, is the setting that there is a fire propagation standard which is under development. It is still under development. So this is something that because the, the problem in, in Europe is that fire regulation is a matter of national and local uh, level. So each country has like like the, the power or, or the, the means to establish the different um, fire regulation. And what happens right now, we, for example, regarding fire propagation, is that uh, there are like 16 different standards, and there is uh, an ongoing project, which is lead by RISE, to uh, obtain a, a harmonized standard for the whole Europe. So this is something that also needs to be 
address. Also, uh, regarding file resistance, that as you, as you remember is file containment, it, it is stated that there is some uh, testing done according to Japanese and uh, standard with ISO curve, giving like good results or good correlation. But it is also something uh, that it is stated that there is not so much knowledge or so much experience to say, okay, uh, with this uh, test we can assure that every PIP system will withstand a fire or will contain a fire. So we need to do additional tests. And finally, and I think this is also an important point, that uh, there are like no design design principles for the installation, commissioning, design of uh, BIP systems. And this was in, in 2020. I think right now this standard IEC TR63223 is, is already published. But I think that maybe it's, it's published, but, but maybe people don't know it or don't use it. So this is something that we need to take in, into consideration. Uh, again, uh, talking about background, I, I take this paper that was issued this year, and the, the, I, I think that the, the matters or the problems are quite similar. In, in case of reaction to fire, they are saying that what would happen if, because we are testing a fire, we are doing fire tests to, uh, to BIP modules or BIP products or whatever, but they are not active, electrically active. So is this something that could change the behavior? So imagine that uh, this material is creating energy in, a, in operational conditions. This is this could change the fire behavior. This is something that we don't know. Also, they are talking about the hazards related to fire extinction. So because if you, if you have seen some, uh, some fires, for example, in the US, it seems that the, when there is a fire in, in the roof, the people approach there, uh, but it's something difficult to because there is no, no, not so much knowledge and also the fire may be very extensive or very huge. So this, this is something that we need to address, how we can evaluate or how we can fire fight uh, this kind of fires. And finally, smoke toxicity, which is not only for PV systems, but it's for every construction, construction product. I, this is something I, I cannot understand, because when there is a fire, everybody knows, maybe not everybody, but usually, the, the deaths are due to, to, the, to, the, to the smoke, not to the, to the to, to fire or burning. Because first, you, you, when there is a fire, a huge amount of smoke will be created. That probably you get disoriented, you cannot see the somebody's door because there is very smoke, uh, very opaque smoke in the, in the ambient. And so, so you get nervous, you get anxious, and you, you hear, you take all the, this smoke. So probably first you you lose your uh, your control and eh? you fall down and finally, finally you, you get burned. But smoke toxicity is, is something that is not considered. Uh, if we talk about the BIP rules, uh, the same. Uh, there is um, some uh, concerns about the heat that is created uh, uh, behind the the solar roofs, or there are also that. Usually in, in some um, flat roofs, there are also combustible elements like membranes or uh, insulation foams or whatever. And this is also something that, in combination with uh, with PV modules, can uh, can affect uh, the, the fire behavior. And also, again, the fire fighting uh, and evacuation issues that are not well addressed. I put here the link if you want to, to check the, this document. I think it's interesting for you, as you are a VIPB expert. Uh, if we go again, uh, this is the same document, but I, I, right now I would like to, to talk about the picture on the, on the right. That, that, that for me is very important to, to understand. And this is uh, about the fire scenario. I mean, I don't know if it's easy to, to manage this, but here, this is, for example, a, a, an internal fire that is, could be created in, inside the room, and there, is, there are many different uh, fire spread mechanisms. Could be in the junction between the slab and the facade. Could be also imagine that this is the case here in the in this uh, curtain wall that you have a, an existing wall and you put another wall, so you have a double skin system, and th there is a, an additional fire spread here. And also that could be an additional fire spread if some window breaks here and goes to the to the to the outer layer of the, of the facade. So, for example, for, for, for the internal fire, 
there are like three different file spread mechanisms. And each one has to be analyzed or designed or treated as individually. Also, there is a, a, a possibility, imagine that you have a, right now, we, it, it is a trend that to have uh, electric cars that probably are also here. And imagine that electric cars gets burned, so can affect also the facade. And finally, last but not least, also the, the PBI itself, the BIPB itself can, can, can burn because there are maybe some mechanisms or electrical failures or arcing or whatever fail, failure can, can happen in a BIPB. So this is, this is what I meant when, when I talk about the fire scenario. This is, scenario is one, two or three, and they are very different uh, heat sources, they are different uh, firepower, it's not the same. So this is something that is, I think it's, it's important to, to point out. And of course, here again, the same. There is no, uh, there is no review. There is not a crafted standard or customized standard for, for BIPB. The PV codes don't, don't address the potential fire risk and so on and so forth. So I think we are talking about the same. And those two documents are from 2020 and 2022. And there are much more. I didn't put all, all them, but just with, it, with those two, you, you, you can check it also here in this, uh, in this link and to understand which is the, the magnitude of, of the fire issue. Okay, so also I would like to talk about the current standard and regulation. So, which are the means that uh, the manufacturers or designers or even the laboratories like us have to, to try to, let's say, evaluate this fire risk. Here, this one is um, a, a thermal standard. So uh, it's a EIC 61730 part two, which is dealing with the uh, safety <laughs> measures of, uh, of PV modules. And uh, regarding fire, it is a complete document, but regarding fire is talking about two different uh, tests. This one is called the fire test, and this one is the flammability test. For example, if we talk about this flammability test, well, we need to understand it that, that the test is trying to represent a match or a lighter. So we are putting a match or a lighter in, in, the, in the PV module. So this is the scenario. It's not a fully developed fire, it's not a car burning, it's just a match or lighter that is giving us some, some uh, information regarding the, the, the fire spread that could happen in the, in the material. Also, we have this, this other test, the fire test, which is basically based on the CNTS-1187. And here, it, it is this, in this case, it's for roofs. This one could be for roofs and for walls, but this one is just for roofs. And the idea here is that you place four, four different modules here, like, like a system, and you place here a basket full of uh, wood fiber. So you burn the wood fiber, and you check if there is a vertical spread or it's not a spread, or even if there is some penetration in the system, okay? And here, what we are trying to represent is, imagine that there is a fire in an adjacent building that and some brands are coming to, the, to our building. So this is the scenario. It's not a PV module that is getting burned or it's not an internal fire that is getting out. It's just some fire, which is in, a, in another building that is falling down to our system. So this is that we are trying to to check here. And this is about uh, Senelec standards. If we go to CN standards, we have this, uh, this um, let's say, product standard for BIP modules and also for BIP systems. And here it's, in terms of fire, they, are, they talk about just this standard, which is the, the previous one. So it's the same as, as before, this uh, external roof test and the flammability test. So if we, if we take a look to this, doesn't give us much more information. And it, it, because here, this standard separates, let's say, the electrical requirements and the building related requirements. So here um, the are the electrical requirements, and here the building related. For example, in this case, this standard is talking just about classification standards. So the EN 3501, part one, two, three, four, five, are just for classification but they are based on test methods. If you don't say which method you, you need to, to use, 
it's useless because you are not saying anything. You need to, to address, okay, if, if the system meets a curtain wall, you need to test the fire testing for curtain wall. Or if it's a, an internal partition, you need to do, I mean, this is not giving, it's giving, out, giving us some tips, but not the whole information. And this is the, 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 what I put here, that no reference to a specific standard is, is done. And, and also, something that also came to my attention is that there is no, no fire requirement for external elements like balconies or shading. But so this is not addressed in, in this standard. But uh, I, I believe that also a solar shade or a balcony can catch fire. So there's something that maybe also need to be reviewed. If we go to the to the next one, which is the, the part two of the, this standard, it's similar approach. We have the, the electric requirements, and when we talk about the fire, again the same. They, they put the classification standards, but no, no the test standards. But this is something that also I think Theo mentioned before, that there is a definition for BIPV and BAPV, which is also I think it's important to understand because sometimes it is something that is also confusing for for many people. And finally, I will say a few words about our building code, the Spanish building code, which is the CTE, where uh, in our case for roofs, we are using this classification standard and this testing standard, the CNTS1187, but method T1. Maybe you know it, but in this standard, there are like four methods. The first one, it's just to place the, the burning brands, as you, see, as you saw before, and, and to, to put fire in the, in the burning brands. The second one is this burning brand in combination with wind load. So you put like a ventilator to, uh, to do the test. The third one, it's the burning brands together with a radiation, trying to simulate. In both cases, method two wind load is because it's an outdoor environment, so there is usually wind. In the case of um, T3, which is a radiation, it's you have sand, so it is radiating to the system. And finally, method T4, which is I think it's only asked in uh, in UK, if I'm not wrong. Uh, this is only a combination between the burning brands, the wind, and the radiation. So it's a very complete or more complete uh, uh, scenario. Because uh, if you remember before, in uh, Sweden and Norway, they say that method T3 was not was not enough. So probably method T4 is better, but they are even saying that maybe there is a American standard that maybe it's more, uh, let's say, more, maybe it's better. But, but anyway, here in Spain, we are using the T1 that seems that it's not uh, the best one. And regarding facades, we have this mentioned this classification standard, and according to the building height, you have different classifications or requirements. So there is something. And also there is um, this part, this I think it's very important to, to point out, that there is like a 10% of the total surface that maybe could be out of a, know, out of a standard or maybe cannot, uh, because both in the, in the roof and both in the, in the facade, they are talking about this 10% of uh, the facade that could be out of uh, requirement. I, I don't know. This is something that could probably be for some uh, signals or some uh, parts that cannot be avoided. So, regarding the, our experience as Tenalia, uh, I will talk about a few projects that we have been working. Probably some of you are also working in those projects. The first one is uh, PV sites. I think Chema already explained uh, the the system that we tested, we tested, we installed here in, in this building. And in, in our case, in the fire lab, what we did was, was uh, let's say, the, the SBI test and the flammability test. The SBI, as you may know, it's, it's a corner test where you put a fire in, in the corner and you check the fire spread, but also you are collecting all the smoke generated here and you are checking the um, the content of uh, this smoke and also the opacity of this smoke. You are not 
uh, analyzing the toxicity, but the opacity. So at least you have some parameters that are relevant for, for the final installation. And in this case, we, we, we also classify with, with this standard. And regarding the, the sample, we tested, um, let's say, uh, this uh, PB glass with a air gap behind, like, like it is in here in the in reality. But we didn't put any joints in the, in the specimen. And this also has some, uh, let's say, some influence in the, in the final outcome of the test. But in this case, we did it with the airway gap behind and with no joints. If we go, go to the next uh, project, it's energy matching, which is one that was done in 2019. In this case, it was, uh, let's say, a, a, a click and go superstructure and also, again, a PV glass. And we tested according to this standard that, that is, uh, I, I already mentioned. And we tested like three different configurations, putting this burning branch in the middle of the, of the PV module, also putting in the in one, uh, let's say, horizontal or, or transfer joint, and another one in a longitudinal joint to check if there is some uh, because here, if, we, if you put this bony brand uh, on top of, of, of a PB glass, probably it's not happening anything. But if you put it here in, the, in some joints, some uh, heat or some flames can go to different parts and can, can happen on things. Okay, I won't give much information because I think it's, it's confidential, but you can imagine that it's, it's different if you put the fire in the, in the joint or in the because there are other materials, not just not just the PV glass and so on. Also, regarding the, the facades, we tested we tested again uh, ventilated or rain stream PV glass. And in this case, we, we tested like three, three different configurations. The first one with, with an air cavity and vertical and horizontal joints, but with, without any insulation behind. Because usually, when we when you have a rain screen system, you have an air gap behind, but usually you put insulation. And we don't have too much. Time. Okay, well. sorry. Okay, and uh, and I mean uh, also here, the second one was with with insulation behind, and this one with uh, also uh, some retention clips and other fixings. And in those three cases, we saw different uh, behavior. Okay, and finally, uh, the BIP boost, which was on the last year, we went a bit further. So we tried to, to develop an, an internal procedure to address a different thing, because in this case, it was a solar shading system that seems to be out of uh, at least the Spanish uh, building code. So we put this fire here that's, that was trying to simulate an external fire, imagine a motorcycle or container or whatever that is getting, getting burn and affect the, the lower part of the, of the system. In this case, there were like three, three different modules also uh, in, in this uh, click and go system. Okay, and I have, I think I have no, no much time. So talking about further research, right now we are doing, a, or we are working in a, in a new project, which is Misiro E. And here in this project, we are trying to address this kind of uh, gaps or this kind of system. Uh, topics that are not addressed uh, right now. The first one we are trying to do is to do this fire test that we have seen before, but try to simulate a couple effects. I mean, not just to put the fire runs here, but also to energize the system. So we are going to test it outdoors with, 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 with solar influence, and we would like to see, we will do a test indoors, another one outdoors, and the others will be also connected to, to voltage. So the idea is to see if having this voltage is changing the behavior of, of, the, of the system. Also, we have this uh, large uh, diameter ventilator that will be, will be used for two uh, tests. First one, it's uh, a mechanical test because we want to check uh, dynamic uh, wind load in a, in, a, in a facade system. But also, we want to, to use this uh, ventilator to combine, combine fire and, and wind load in a, let's say, in, in a big uh, scale. Not just a module, but maybe three, four modules and to see what happens. And finally, we are 
we are not building this uh, calorimetric hood that will, will give us the possibility to to create different scenarios. Our idea is to to, to burn different um, PV modules, uh, like putting, for example, putting uh, overloading the, the system or putting a additional uh, fire sources or whatever, and to analyze, it would be a calorimetric hood. So here we are going to, to fire everything. We are going to collect all the all the smoke here, and here we are going to analyze the content of the smoke. Right now, just O2, CO, and CO2. But the idea is also uh, thinking about toxicity to test it in the, in the future. And uh, I didn't have time to put the, the final slide, but also we are right, we have done two tests according to the new European standard for fire propagation. So this is something that we are also developing. Then I think it's it's all from my side. Thank you, Xavier, for the next presentation. Uh, other questions? The audience? Yeah, Rebecca, go ahead. I do have a lot of questions, but I do have two. So, the first one is that a common problem for fire testing is that uh, even with the fire test, with one design configuration, if they change the design configuration, then with there is going to be another test. That's not cost effective. So practically, how can we address this? Practically, well, I also think so, well, just for the people online, uh, Rebecca is asking about the, how if you change the configuration of your system, how it impacts on the uh, uh, on the test that you have to perform. Yeah, I, I would say that you have you need to try to to find the most onerous configuration. So imagine that you have a family of configurations, you, you have different joints or or sizes or whatever. So you have to try to let's say to do probably uh, the the worst case scenario, test it and cover all all, all the rest. Even in some, in some, uh, for example, in fire systems, there are standards to test, but also standards to extend the application of results. So they give, they give you some tips, saying, okay, if you test this this configuration, you can cover also those. Problems. But of, of course, I think the most important thing is that to understand that we are talking about a system. So any change in the in the system probably affects the fire behavior. My next question, very quickly, is that you have downloads. So she's asking about uh, the simulations yeah. okay. in, with fire. Yeah, in this case, about simulations, the, the last equipment that we are trying to, no, no, we are building, in fact, and it will be finished by, by this, uh, this month, is to gather information for uh, ultra simulation. So the idea is to, to burn different materials, different uh, modules, systems, and so on, and to get experimental data to put later in a simulation program. There, there are five simulation programs, but usually they are using, uh, let's say, uh, typical data or standard data. So we, are, we want to, to build new data with this uh, experimental capacity, and after we are going to, to use those simulation programs. Yeah, yeah. okay. You mentioned the fire test and the fire regression, but do you have any uh, real fire accidents in Spanish BATV. I don't know. I, I, I would I would say I would say that I have seen so so many BATV fires, but maybe BAP not yet. That doesn't mean that, that, that won't, it won't happen or, or not. It means right BATV now. BATV is safe enough. I, I, I would say that there are not so much still in the in the market. Yeah. Because it's easy to understand. For example, this example of the double glazing system that we have here. In the, in the let's say in the uh, behind the, the the front face, you have like 
many combustible materials like junction box, cables, connections between modules. And also you have, a let's say, an air gap that is giving you a chimney effect. So there is a combination of chimney, chimney effect and combustible material. I would say that, that this is a risk that could uh, finally end in, in a fire. But maybe there are not so much uh, installations you get. What I can say is that we have tested in the laboratory VIP systems and they burn. <laughs> so, yeah. what can I say? Maybe they are not, not uh, real. Uh, not sure. But I believe that maybe the problem is the deployment of, in the market. It's not that, that the VIP is because in this study, I didn't, the, I didn't take part in this study, but someone says that. There was like ten times higher risk in VIPV. So I guess that they have some uh, information that I, because up to now, what I really know is that uh, these fires in, uh, in uh, let's say, industrial roofs like uh, typical Amazon or this kind of uh, storage uh, facilities. In Japan, we had uh, many fire cases. Uh, in the uh, Roof style integrated TV. These uh, accidents were due to the combination of defective TV panels and the uh, insufficient uh, installer. Uh, I, I, I agree with you that, uh, and that's why I, I, I repeat again and again that the fire scenario is very important to understand because when, when we talk about these tests, we are putting like a external fire source. I'm not talking about the internal fire source. And this is something that, that should be also addressed because there, there could be some products uh, wrongly insta installed or uh, fa failure of the components or whatever that will create a fire in the in the module itself. But this is not addressed in this, in this kind of tests. Well, I think uh, we have to finish the, the talk here because we have to <laughs> We are already quite delayed. So, well, thank you, Xavier. <laughs> there was another uh, more fire questions in the in one line, but uh, we, we have to finish. Um, well, um, I have prepared some closing points, but I'm not going to, to go into detail. Uh, well, just to say some important things. We want to take, okay. <laughs> Well, uh, the presentations will be available uh, online. We will actually, we will send you uh, by email the presentations and uh, we will check the videos and I think if, if everything is fine, that I hope so, we will also share the videos. Um, by the way, the PV facade that Chema presented, uh, you can see it here in this building. So maybe if you want, just uh, before leaving the building, you can go to the left and you can see it uh, uh, there. The, the outer side and uh, well finally I would like to to thanks all these international people that have decided to come here to San Sebastian and well I hope you have had a, a good time here in San Sebastian and we'll see you in following meetings right <laughs> and now it's our turn from task 15 from the IAPVPS program also to say thank you very much to Daniel and all of your team at Technalia. I think the workshop this morning was an excellent example of uh, exchange of knowledge between speakers who have their background in the task program and the people here in Spain who are really putting BIPV installations and testing them. And it was for me very encouraging then with the very last speaker to see as a I would say external to our task, was referring to task results. So that's very encouraging for us as researchers. And of course, we need as researchers the input from the people out in the practice, what is needed, what should we be doing? We're preparing the next phase 
and we're very interested in input and industry involvement. So you have your local contacts here, and I'm sure they will be passing on any expressions of interest in becoming more closely involved in the PVPS next phase of task 15. Please speak to Daniel or your other contacts, Jose Maria, um, and let us know, because we're really at the stage where we can use that information, where we can use new participants, and particularly from the industry, from architecture, people who are applying BIPD systems. So thank you again very much. We're very grateful. Thank you.